Empecemos entonces. Voy a hacer una muy breve presentación en castellano, que es la más activa que debe hacer en castellano. Mañana va a ser una presentación un poco más amplia, contando la historia de Steam, que está con nosotros y de Soulwalk. We have you have you with us. Um, Steven Tester es profesor de la Universidad de Göttingen, en Alemania. <coughs> Cuatro años, yo he estado en por cuatro años en Alemania. Y eh, es un especialista en Lichtenberg, sin duda, también en filosofía del siglo XVIII. Y voy a presentar hoy día una uh, ponencia, una comunicación sobre el concepto de raza, que es obviamente un concepto particularmente relevante para el siglo XVIII, para Lichtenberg también, para Kant también, desde luego. Eh, mañana va a ser la conferencia sobre. Uh, I just know myself. Pero hoy día vamos a tener esta conferencia sobre raza. Eh, y eh, vamos a partir con Steven, después va a seguir Luis Plasencia, a quien le agradezco mucho que esté también con nosotros acá. Y yo termino, cuando espero que ya no haya nadie, termino yo en el tercer lugar. Y ese es nuestro orden y tenemos textos que son relativamente amplios. Vamos a leer los textos. Eh, yo creo que tendremos unas dos horas por delante, más o menos. Eso, entonces, sí, Luis. Thank you, Pablo, for this very kind introduction, some of which I, I understood, most of which I didn't. Um, and thank you all for, for coming. Um, Lichtenberg's scholars, that's a, that's a very small, dedicated, dedicated group of people and the people who are even interested in Lichtenberg at all is, is not much larger than that, that small group. So it's nice that all of you um, are here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so um, as Pablo pointed out, I'm going to be talking about um, Lichtenberg on race and human difference. Um, and then tomorrow I'll talk more broadly about Lichtenberg's idealism and um, his views on himself. So uh, the 17th and 18th centuries um, were an exciting time for the de developments in the emerging science of anthropology and ethnography, for travel writing and encounters with different cultures. Uh, these developments were accompanied by attempts at philosophical and even empirical studies on the nature of human differences that Europeans discovered on their travels, and by attempts to explain the origin of these differences. Such reflections, however, also led to attempts at racial classifications that are often accompanied by assertions about the nature of race that seem only to reflect dominant stereotypes of the period. So in this paper, I'd like to look at Lichtenberg's contributions to these discussions of race and human difference. Um, but before turning to Lichtenberg's own contributions, I'd like to contextualize his thought a little bit within two important facets of the discussion of race in the 18th century. Um, these two, two sort of poles of the discussion. One is the debate about biological realism and constructivism or conventionalism about race. And the second, the second poll is the debate in the German-speaking context about the nature of dispositions or Anlagen uh, that, that um, are supposed to underlie external phenotypic differences um, among people. So the debate between realist and constructivist positions is encapsulated in many respects in Leibniz's famous response to Locke regarding classification. In new essays on human understanding, Leibniz disputes Locke's claim um, in an essay concerning human understanding that man is just a name and that there are gradations of humanity that would not allow for a strict distinction between humans and animals that was not merely a matter of convention. Whereas Leibniz adheres to the view that species among which man is one are natural, essential, or real kinds, Locke argues that species de designations are wholly conventional and that there's no universal species of mankind. The debate between realist and conventionalist views about humans was also closely related to broader debates about the so-called degeneration of races, where thinkers 
who held a monogenetic um, and realist view of the origin of human species, tried to understand human phenotypic difference as a process of degeneration from a single human type. For example, due to climate or cultural practices or due to species hybridism, interbreeding of, of humans and animals, for example. Um, this is where another important background to Lichtenberg's discussion of race enters the, the picture, namely Kant and his discussion of dispositions or Anlagen. And his, on the different races of, of man, um, 1775, Kant argues for a monogenetic view according to which humans all descended from a single genus which contained the seeds of time or dispositions on Magen for the production of mental and physical traits associated with distinct races when these dispositions come into contact with differing environmental factors. It's not entirely clear how Kant believed race and external phenotypic traits align with dispositions. However, he does suggest that certain races, when transported to a different climate, will fail to thrive because of their natural disposition. It's very common in the period. For example, um, the, the attempts at the so-called quote-unquote civilizing of Africans would fail due to a natural disposition and temperament of this race that would run counter to the European climate. And um, when they refer to climate, they mean um, not only weather, but but, but the nature of the society where, um, where these other races are, are, are to be um, integrated. Um, and so Kant's views on, on race shift throughout his um, shift throughout his, his career and his writings, but this notion of a disposition remains a consistent feature of his position. Um, Kant's notion of a disposition Anlage is echoed by the physiognomists in the period, such as the Swiss physician Lavater, and by others doing philosophical and anthropology, such as Christoph Miners. Lavater popularized the practice of discerning personalities from facial features with his physiognomic fragments. Um, he argued that the dis instinctive tendency to draw conclusions about intelligence and moral character from facial features was a kind of physiognomical sensation that we all possess. It's a sort of ability that we all have that we can look at um, different people and discern um, from their physical facial features what kind of moral character they have. Um, um, we probably don't need Lichtenberg to tell us that that's, that's kind of crazy, but we'll, we'll see what he says about it anyway. Um, so that, that kind of assertion was based on a religious belief that there was some natural correspondence between the external features of the face and inner features, including intelligence and virtue. Um, Lavater thought that discerning physiognomists could see the natural disposition or anlage from the face despite the fact that external factors such as climate may have worked with this disposition to form um, that particular face. So this is, this is a view held by Lavater, but also by another person named Georg Ernst Stahl. It's very, very sort of popular in the 19th century. Um, so it's pretty clear that Lavater was aware of um, the Kantian notion of disposition. He quotes him at length. Um, but what's interesting is that Lavater confuses some central features of the Kantian picture. Kant had made a metaphysical, or perhaps a biological claim, about the role of dispositions in producing outward features. However, he doesn't go to great lengths explaining the epistemic grounds for such an assertion. And when he does broach this topic, it's in the context of a discussion of teleology and nature, and would need to be understood um, in, in that sort of context in, in Kant's writings. Lavater, in contrast, um, turns Kant's metaphysical claims about dispositions producing outward features on its head. Lavater insists, uh, and instead makes the epistemological claim that dispositions can be discerned from the outward features of a, of a person. Um, and the physiognomist is supposed to be able to see from some space that they have the disposition and character of a criminal, um, for example. Um, um, 
this leads the physiognomist to make um, some well-known and problematic uh, assertions, uh, typical stereotypes about races, for example, that where black skin is associated with an immoral disposition and stupidity, white skin is associated with morality and industriousness. Um, so entire groups of people are written off on the basis of, of, of certain features. Um, so this is where, this is the context in which Lichtenberg is, is writing his physiognomy um, text. Um, so Lichtenberg would have certainly been aware of the Leibniz lock debate on man and realism or conventionalism about species. And he would have been aware of Kant's ideas of dispositions, um, either through Lavater's text itself or through his Göttingen associates, um, Blumenbach and Miners. Um, it's also likely that he read um, Kant's text on race himself. So in Lichtenberg's On Physiognomy Against the Physiognomist, which appeared in 1778, um, the context, uh, so the, the debate was primarily aimed at Lavater's physiognomy and other texts on physiognomy. Although Lichtenberg himself appears to have been persuaded to some degree by physiognomy early on, um, in 1770-1774-1775, he presents lectures on physiognomy that are somewhat sympathetic to the view. Um, he eventually turns to a criticism of it, and he criticizes, he criticizes it on, um, on several points. The first is, is about the epistemology involved in physiognomy. The second is about the met metaphysics of causation that it presupposes. And the third is about um, aesthetics and the relativity um, of aesthetic judgments, um, and also more broadly about classification. Um, <clears throat> so we'll look at that, that criticism before then turning to Lichtenberg's um, own, what I would call his sort of positive view on this, which is not to be um, thought of as positive, which is in fact quite dark and um, divergent from his, his criticism of physiognomy. Um, so as I mentioned previously, Lavater's physiognomy turns the Kantian notion of a disposition on its head. Lavater argues that valid inferences can be made from outward behavior and appearances to the natural dispositions that underlie these outward features. Christenberg attacks this dubious inference, arguing that we have no epistemic ground for the inference because it's not a necessary inference. One reason for this is that natural dispositions, if there are such things, are not the sole and sufficient ground for outward appearances. As Lichtenberg points out, a lot of things contribute to our appearance, not just uh, natural disposition of our soul. Um, climate, repeated behaviors, fashion, culture, accents, all have an influence on our appearance and, and on our behavior. Um, so we can't make an inference from, from these, these outward appearances to a soul ground in a natural disposition. And the physiognomist has no principled way to set the limits about the kinds of inferences they make regarding natural dispositions. So the physiognomists clearly believe that um, facial features are indicators of natural dispositions. Um, but what about things like uh, intelligence or beauty or size? Um, are these also indicators of natural disposition? Um, Lichtenberg sums this up nicely with, with a little joke um, where he says, if the most beautiful souls inhabit the most beautiful bodies, then why not say the biggest souls inhabit the biggest bodies? So there's sort of problems with um, the, ex the extent of um, the inferences that physiognomists make. Um, Lichtenberg's second point, and this is closely related to the first, is about causation. He criticizes the physiognomist for mistaking mere correlation for causation. Just because certain outward features are repeatedly accompanied by certain natural dispositions doesn't mean these dispositions are the sole and sufficient cause of the outward features. Um, here he sees the, the physiognomists um, just being poor scientists, I suppose. They see, they see certain features re repeatedly associate those with a certain disposition, but they have no basis there for, for making the claim that the disposition is the cause of the outward feature. Um, 
And Lichtenberg, thirdly, he also criticizes the notions of beauty and aesthetics in general that underlie the physiognomist's inferences. So they argue, for example, that a beautiful face is the natural manifestation of a natural disposition toward virtue. Um, but there's an unspoken idea of beauty that underlies the physiognomic viewpoint, and it's derived from uh, 18th century aesthetics of Dinkelmann and Roman notions of, of, of beauty. Um, Lichtenberg, in contrast, suggests that different cultures and different time periods, and periods may hold different ideas of, of beauty. Um, and if that's true, the inference from a Western European standard of beauty to a natural disposition to virtue that underlies this beauty is, is dubious, of course. Um, and Lichtenberg also um, suggests that virtue and virtuous behaviors themselves can be relative. So not only can our standard of beauty be rel uh, relative, but also our views about um, what is virtuous and not. Um, so the same action can be regarded as a crime in one context and as something to be praised in another context. Um, and of course, in, in this regard, Lichtenberg is, is arguing implicitly against Kantian um, aesthetics, universal judgments, and, and Kantian, um, Kantian ethics as well. Um, Beyond Lichtenberg's disagreement with the physiognomists about our epistemic position relative to dispositions, he also makes a contribution to the related contemporary debate about realism and classification. The physiognomist assumes that classifications of races on the basis of outward features have some biological ground um, in dispositions. Since dispositions bring about the differences in outward features associated with race, the classifications based on these features are grounded in real differences. Um, uh, this is also, I, I think, in, in the background of um, other other people's views, not only the physiognomist, but Christoph Meiners, who was uh, a philosopher working in Göttingen, who's a contemporary of Lichtenberg's, who also did a lot of research on um, racial classification. Um, so in contrast with the realist position on race, Lichtenberg argues for the Lockean position that races are nothing more than groups that we can construct on the basis of arbitrarily chosen features and associations. It probably seems obvious from a contemporary <laughs> point of view that something like that is, is, is the case, but um, maybe not so obvious in the 18th century. Uh, um, Lichtenberg rarely speaks about race and classification, but his position follows from his general constructivist view of classification, which can be drawn from a range of statements in the waste books. In one remark in particular, he draws a clear analogy between how we think about laws of nature and how we think about racial categories. He writes, quote, laws are merely conceived of by us just as we create races. Um, so there's a clear tendency in Lichtenberg to regard natural laws themselves as, as tools that allow us to structure the world. Um, uh, they're not really there to be found in nature, but it just sort of allows us to organize uh, a nature. Um, and similarly, racial categories allow us to divide up humans into different groups. Um, the problem, though, as Lichtenberg points out, is that uh, the practical value of doing that is questionable. Um, it leads to prejudice and wrong-headed thinking, um, particularly when we make the leap from classification on the basis of outward appearance to some disposition underlying it. Um, that's a view that you can see in his writings on Hogarth and Linnaeus. Um, um, and he also has a sort of clever formulation here. He satirizes this, this sort of system of classification, saying that, um, you could apply it to the kingdom of furniture as well as you could to the wigs of, of the clergymen. So it's just a sort of way of dividing up the, the world according to certain features, um, but it doesn't have some sort of deeper underlying biological um, ground. Um, so rather than dispositions being responsible for phenotypic human differences, Lichtenberg maintains um, that climate is the only factor that determines outward features. This overall positive view on racial differentiation is inspired by Buffon and by Forster, um, a 
other people thinking about race in the period on the basis of travel writing that was done in the 18th, 18th century. Um, Lichtenberg points out in an analogy with the house that we have to understand how the individuals are adapted and built for their circumstances and their climate. Um, that also explains, for example, why he suggests there's some truth to pathogamy um, rather than physiognomy. Um, the latter pathogamy posits, um, uh, sorry, physiognomy posits dispositions as grounds for outward features, whereas pathogamy only looks at how behavior and external features, um, climate and culture affect, affect appearance. So um, in pathogamy, you might say, well, we can clearly see this person is a sad person because they have certain wrinkles in their face from repeated frowning, something like that, which Lichtenberg thinks is a, a legitimate um, uh, thing to say. Um, um, so in addition to his statements on physiognomy, Lichtenberg's responses to the pernicious views of his Gretchen colleague, Christopher Miners, provides some insight into his views on race. Um, Miners distinguishes, as is well known, between the Caucasian and the Mongolian peoples, um, where as the former is associated with physical beauty, um, and the latter is associated with um, all the other undesirable features, typical um, schema for, for, for that sort of racial thinking. Um, Um, but Miners also does this on the basis um, of a notion of anmaga. Although he's not systematic about it, he does have this idea of a disposition or anmaga in his writings. Um, so he'll often use the formulation such as disposition of mind or original disposition, um, nature, which refers to immutable characteristics, unchangeable characteristics of various races um, that are supposed to be tied to their separate origins. Um, um, he argues that their disposition is fitted to the climate and land where the, the various peoples are found, um, and that nature made it such that people are adapted to the climate in which they are found. And for miners, there, there's really no reason to explain the differences in people on the basis of external features like climate. He thinks it can all be explained, explained on the basis of disposition. So why certain people look certain ways in certain places, why they have certain cultural practices there, um, probably the language that they speak, all of this can be sort of boiled down to natural dispositions. Um, he also, um, Miners, was a person who held a polygenetic view of, of origins of humans, so he would, ex in, instead of this sort of biblical narrative where humans all emerge from one single lineage um, and, and various changes occur, um, Miners held this view that um, people arose in different parts of the world simultaneously, right? so they um, could arise with different sorts of dispositions. Um, and this is um, something that Lichtenberg is also um, resistant in, in, in part to um, um, for example, he uh, in a letter that he writes to, to Forrester in July 1791, um, Lichtenberg argues against this minarian view of, of dispositions, and um, in particular, Miner's hierarchical description of race. So, I mean, as Miner's is really terrible. I mean, you get you know the, the Caucasians, and then there are subspecies of Caucasians that are better than than others, and then it sort of goes down the line. Um, so Lichtenberg is really resistant to this. Um, and that's not surprising given, given what he says in his physiognomy um, text. However, there are parts of Lichtenberg's writings that are, that are, are, that are problematic, and I think we need to, to look at those to understand um, how, it is that he's, how it is that he's thinking about um, racial differences. Um, 
and to see if he, he's actually able to resist the Kantian and Meinerian view. So Lichtenberg has a, has a clear interest in other cultures. We can see this, um, for example, from his various, um, various writings um, in which he champions groups of peoples against stereotypes. Um, in a text from 1791, he's arguing, for example, against um, prejudices against Hottentots. Um, um, and in these descriptions, though, um, of other cultures and other peoples, um, he also uses stereotypes in, in these descriptions. Um, so I'll just mention a few uh, of them. Um, in a 1782 text on, on the, the trade with Negroes, or on the slave trade, um, the text, in the text he recognizes the existence of slave trade before the Europeans, um, but also discusses the catastrophic consequences of the European and Northern American slave trade, suggesting that Europeans corrupted the culture of, of enslaved people. people. Um, but he also, in this text, he falls into stereotypes um, typical of the period, suggesting that the people who were um, forced into slavery were already violent by nature, and in some ways this is a, just a, a way of justifying, um, justifying the slave trade. Um, and, and when he does that, it seems that he does appeal to an idea of an anlaga, or natural disposition, um, which is which is clearly in tension with his um, adherence to the climatological view of, of racial difference. Um, this is, uh, the tension is really clear um, between the climatological and dispositional view of race um, and his encounter with a figure known as Mai. Mai, who was known in England at the time as uh, Omai von Ulieta, had traveled from Tahiti with Cook on Cook's second voyage. During his two-year stay in England, Mai was very involved in British high society and became the focal point for numerous discussions among intellectuals in England about race and human nature, as well as the subject of various plays and paintings. He was often depicted in the vein of the noble savage or as a curiosity in need of classification. Lichtenberg encounters Mai on one of his trips to England um, in March 1775, and Lichtenberg describes this in his journal. He describes Mai as, quote, shaking hands in the, the English manner, and he reinforces stereotypes of the period in his backhanded praise that, quote, he is fully grown and his demeanor does not have the unpleasant and dog likeness of Negroes. His color is a yellow brown, almost like children at heads or his mother is a white one. So again, um, availing himself of, of stereotypes uh, of the period. But I think what's more revealing for the purpose of the, of the discussion right now is the question he asks Mai when he meets him. Lichtenberg asks Mai how he finds the climate in England, to which Mai responds, it's cold, cold, cold. Um, so Lichtenberg, I think, is not, he wasn't just making small talk here, but He's really seeking answers about whether, in fact, Mai could adapt to the climate in England. Um, uh, this is, I, I, I think, a genuine, genuine question with, with which he is um, with which he's struggling here. So on the one hand, he appears to argue against the notion of a natural disposition, suggesting in the physiognomy essay and elsewhere that man is fully adaptable and that differences are due solely to climate and environment. And on the other hand, he often appeals to this natural disposition here. He's wondering whether Mai has the appropriate disposition to, um, to fit in um, physically, but also, also culturally in, into, um, into, into Europe. Um, now, uh, this is especially, and it becomes especially evident in Lichtenberg's really problematic writings on Jews in, in the 18th century. Um, so there's a, there's a wide range of interpretations on his statements about Jews. Some suggest that there's no problem at all, and the things he says about Jews aren't so terrible. Um, 
Others clearly recognize that they're prejudiced statements, but say, you know, well, it's what, to be, what you might expect from the 18th century. Um, it's just sort of reflective of the period. Um, and others will argue that it's a later development in his career. Um, so towards the end of life, basically, he becomes a, a grumpy racist. You know. um, <clears throat> but I want to look at um, the way he uses the notion of a disposition in, in um, talking about, um, about Jews. Um, so Lichtenberg's writing about Jews are developed primarily in the satirical text Timorous, a short text um, uh, that was published anonymously in 1773. It concerns the conversion of two Jews through Lavater's arguments and represents Lichtenberg's foray into a very public and controversial affair in which Lavater had challenged Moses Mendelssohn to refute, refute the arguments of the pietist theologian Charles Bonnet or convert to Christianity. So Lavater says to Mendelssohn, uh, if you know, if you can argue that uh, that Christianity is somehow wrong or mistaken, then please do that. Otherwise, you should convert from Judaism to Christianity. Um, it was a very public and scandalous um, debate. And, um, so the challenge gave birth to Mendelssohn's argument for religious tolerance in Jerusalem and his argument that Judaism was a religion founded on reason, thus fitting the Enlightenment. Um, Lichtenberg himself was very critical of Lavater's challenge, a very public challenge, to Mendelssohn. However, given that Timorous, this text, is written anonymously using a fictional, fictional character, a narrator named Conrad Fotorin, it's difficult to discern Lichtenberg's own position from the text. Very difficult. Lichtenberg is writing satirically, so it's very hard to figure out what his own view is and what the views of the narrator are. Um, but at one point in the text, Fotorin claims that two Jews um, in Gertingen were converted by Metvorst, um, not by philosophical arguments, but by the kind of sausage that was available in Gertingen to them. Um, so obviously it's meant to be a satire um, on Lichtenberg's part, but I think it's very suggestive of, of an interpretation. So um, she, someone named Schaefer has recently argued um, uh, that, uh, that what Timorous is presenting is an argument that Jews had a disposition toward recognizing the truth of Christianity, but only needed some external sim stimulus, some kind of material gain for the disposition to manifest itself. So that's um, read as Lichtenberg um, suggesting that yes, Jews have a natural disposition that would make them compatible with Christianity, but you have to do something in order to incite them to that, and that requires offering them material, material gain. So that's, again, relying on these sorts of stereotypes in the, in the period. Um, but I suggest another way to read this is as um, the narrator parodizing, uh, parroting in a satirized way the Kantian idea of the disposition and its interaction with the environment. So according to that reading, the Jews have a natural disposition, one that's compatible with Christianity, but it only needs to be activated through contact with the right environment, namely with German food, with German with the German climate, or the German culture. Um, uh, it's the same reason, for example, that Mendelssohn um, or other Jews, such as Solomon Maimon, who came from the East, um, could be enlightened when they encountered Berlin culture. Um, um, so they only needed the right climate for their natural disposition to flourish. Um, I think that's, that's the sort of way to read, um, read what the narrator is proposing um, there. Um, and uh, Lichtenberg says things like, that are that are suggestive of them as well. That that's the kind of view that he had. Um, but I think, given the nature of the text, it's going to be very difficult to discern from from this particular satirical text what exactly Lichtenberg thought. Um, but his discussion of Jews occurs not only in the context of Lavater's demand that Mendelssohn refute the arguments of, for, for Christianity or convert. They also occur in the broader context of the issue of Jewish emancipation and Jewish, Jewish assimilation in German culture. 
raised in part by domes on the civic improvement. So this very important text from the period called On the Civic Improvement of Jews. In this text, Dohm wrote, at the behest of Mendelssohn, who had been approached by Alsatian Jews for assistance, Dohm argues there for the political equality or the emancipation of the Jews in France and throughout Prussia on the basis of Enlightenment ideals of humanity and reason. According to Dohm, the negative stereotypes often associated with Jews were due not to their dispositions or even religion, but to the restriction of their rights, which forced Jews into morally corrupt behavior. He writes, for example, quote, Jews are only corrupt as human beings and citizens because they have been denied the rights of both, end quote. So Dohm argues that Jews could maintain their religion while nevertheless becoming full citizens and indeed that their self-identification as citizens would eventually supersede their religious identification. In this sense, Jews could be, quote, improved through being given the rights of full citizens. Um, Dome's proposals meet with a variety of, of arguments, both for and against um, the emancipation of Jews. Um, many argued that Jews would first need to improve themselves before they could become citizens, while others argued that Jews were incapable of the kind of moral transformation that would allow them to become citizens. Um, um, figures such as in Göttingen, and such as Michaelis and Schlitzer argued that Judaism was incompatible with the civic values of Prussia, while others, such as Miners, argued that Jews had an inherent nature or disposition that was anathema to, to such integration. Um, so Lichtenberg himself was at times sympathetic to Dohm's argument that the stereotypes associated with Jews are in part the result of their political and economic situation in Prussia. They were oppressed, they weren't given jobs, that's why they tended to steal. That's the sort of argument that, that's being presented there. And, um, Lichtenberg sometimes also um, suggests that. Um, and that's also Fotorian's position in Timoris, the text I was discussing a moment ago. But Lichtenberg also makes explicit statements in the waste books that clearly show his opposition to Jewish emancipation on the grounds that Jews were by nature or disposition incapable of what was required to become participating moral members of Prussian society. Um, these arguments reflect Lichtenberg's genuine um, questions about natural dispositions um, and, and their relation to climate. Um, so he writes, for example, quote, why would we want to work our soil differently to nourish a very useless fruit that does not thrive under our climate and does not want to adapt to it? So why put in the effort to improve the situation of Jews when they are a useless fruit that would not thrive in the grounds? Uh, there anyway, or, quote, why does nature not tolerate, tolerate elephants and rhinoceroses in Lower Saxony, and then he has in parentheses, Jews. Um, so, the, so those kinds of statements reflect his skepticism, his skepticism about the integration of Jews in Germany based on Dohm's proposal. Um, um, and I, I think it can be argued, though, that he's in many ways influenced by his contemporary um, Christoph Miner's views on, on Jews and their dispositions, um, where he's sort of parodying these um, uh, stereotypes that include lack of sensitivity or opportunism, materialism, these sorts of typical um, things that were associated with Jews. Um, um, so, in general, it, it appears that Lichtenberg is actually very skeptical about um, the assimilation of, of Jews in German um, culture, and it's in part because he relies on this notion of a disposition, or Anlage. Um, that, that differs from other kinds of arguments that people were making that suggested, for example, that uh, the Jewish religion was just incompatible with European values. It's a very sort of different reason for suggesting uh, that they wouldn't uh, be able to assimilate. Um, so, so in the end, what are, what are we to make of, of Lichtenberg's writings on race and philosophical anthropology? Um, 
It's been argued that Lichtenberg uses the territory or climate argument for multiple purposes, both to promote integration and to exclude Jews. However, I'd argue that what's more important than mere climatological arguments is how Lichtenberg uses the notion of a disposition for dual purposes. In keeping with the Kantian idea, for example, he appears to wonder whether uh, races are naturally disposed to thrive in certain circumstances or certain climates and others not. Um, but Lichtenberg's statements don't suggest a clear interpretation one way or the other. It's just unclear from his writings. Um, um, but that's not surprising, surprising given the nature of Lichtenberg's writings either. I mean, he very rarely comes down on one side of, of a problem or another, or one side of a question or, or another. But I think importantly it shows that despite Lichtenberg's philosophical reflections on the nature of race and classification, he didn't completely escape from the plot problematic views of Kant, Miners, and Lavater to fully embrace the climatological or conventionalist view suggested in the physiognomy essay. And more importantly, I think it also suggests that the, dark, the sort of darker side of Lichtenberg's writings on race have, may have very little to do with philosophical reflections on race and anthropology, and much more to do with unreflective appeals to stereotypes, as well as social positioning that led him, for example, to want to curtail immigration of Jews in, to Göttingen. Um, unfortunately, that sort of private racism is, is often impervious to philosophical arguments. So even if he were to have made um, philosophical arguments moving away from this notion of disposition, we could nevertheless still find him making racist statements, unfortunately, in his writings. Um, so that's, that's everything I have. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Even if it's a clarification question, if something just wasn't clear, I'm happy to answer that. between the universal plane for reason and uh, the variable constitutions of the body according to climates, despite the monogenetic uh, idea. Um, since, uh, I think it's interesting that contrast, because there was already at the times uh, an instance uh, where that contrast uh, or, or, or where race in a way was externalized as variation. Uh, where reason was externalized as variation in the same place, which was language. Uh, in all the tradition uh, were this big thought in empirical terms, not in transcendental, I mean in mimetic terms or expressive terms, all that tradition where language was seen as, um, uh, or variety of language uh, was seen as variety of ways of thinking that would define the essence of a people. And I'm, I'm, I'm insistent in this is an empirical mimetic way, not in the transcendental way of football to people afterwards. I mean, pre, pre Kantian. And uh, thus, uh, on the one hand, one would have the character of languages as uh, something that would allow a certain romantic tradition to speak about language events as the essence of people, systems of thought, uh, even I mean, later, even in higher years, as more thinking or less thinking languages characterizing uh, a philosophical tradition. But on the other side, we would have in the German tradition uh, uh, a way of thinking language which was different from this more empirical way and different from the ideologues way of thinking language in the French tradition, in which it, it, you would see uh, all the metaphors you were mentioning about bringing plants, uh, not to get so that the plants get used to our own soil, 
uh, to change our soil and change our climate. I mean, that's the kind of metaphor you would find in Schleiermacher and other authors, where they were thinking that language, the German language should be completely penetrated and, and, and uh, invaded by other languages as a way of creating culture, a whole theory of building as, uh, uh, as a way of creating culture through the passive, through the foreign. Um, this, this seems a bit far from where you were, but I'm what I'm trying to say is that this kind of contrast between the universal claims of reason and Kant and the particular manifestations of races, despite the most genetic origin, at the time had a kind of encounter in the variability of languages that allowed to th think about uh, race and reason in a, in a place, uh, which was, uh, and that in the German tradition there were two different ways of thinking, uh, and they would take very different uh, roads in time. One would lead to the more uh, Heideggerian uh, tradition, the other to the more, uh, to the less nationalist of Yanitics. And I was wondering, uh, because I don't know at all, <laughs> uh, how Lichtenberg would be inscribing that kind of panorama, it, or, I mean, maybe might disagree with the panorama in itself, but, but how Lichtenberg would be related to that, um, uh, to that kind of broader panorama where you would find race and reason in a way uh, embodied uh, in different ways in language, in a pre pre-transcendental way, I would say, in a more uh, empirical way. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, thanks, that's um, really interesting. I mean, um, I, I think in, in, I mean, the place would be, to, the place to look for for this would be in Lichtenberg's statements on language, where he says things like uh, uh, language uh, or our expressions reflect uh, reflect something deeper about um, who we are as people. Um, and he proposes that we're um, sort of, I mean, he has these ideas that, uh, that uh, our expressions uh, reflect some deeper philosophy of, of of our culture, right? the kinds of assertions, the kinds of statements that we make, something make uh, are an indicator of something deeper about um, about our culture. Um, I mean, you, you could think of it in you know metaphors of, for example, where I mean he wouldn't say this, but where where capitalist notions of exchange, for example, where we exchange ideas, or whether you buy buy some idea. That someone is proposing, you know, those sorts of those sorts of things reflect something deeper about um, about um, the culture that's using those statements. So I think that would be um, the place the place to look. Um, but I'm not so clear on how he, how he would fit into the into the the sort of broader tradition of. Of thinking about language in Germany, um, on the one hand, I think he's very close to um, certain aspects of Herder and Herder's critique of of, um, of Kant and of Kant on, on race. And I think that's um, you, you might know more about it, but it's probably very closely tied to Herder's notion of of language and on the origins of language. Um, so that I mean, I, I mean, in in a sort of superficial way, he is on the side of, of Herder in critiquing the Kantian views views of race, um, um, and then um, you pointed also this this other tradition of of of, of Schleiermacher and um, this idea where they're using these plant based metaphors um, to to suggest that. Um, what needs to happen is that Germany needs to be opened up through through importing a different language, right, or encounters with, with other languages. And I think um, I think Lichtenberg is also very um, very sympathetic to that, and and we have to be in, if we think of it under this umbrella of a critique of language, right? What what another culture can do for us is make us aware of of the kind of um, hidden philosophy in our language that's expressed in our language, right? um, and in that, and in doing that, um, 
it puts us in a more critical position about our own language, right? We see that other, other cultures, other languages express things differently, and through that we can be more critical of our own, um, of our own linguistic practices. Mm -hmm. um, is and, that, and, is and to your moment, I mean, I was, I spoke too long, too long before, but I was trying to ask if, um, to your knowledge, uh, there is a parody in Lichtenberg, not only of this kind of difference uh, between the realism of the maintenance and the uh, constructivism of the rock, but of the way this embodies in the ideology of language, the idea that languages, I mean, as if there is a critique of race, is there a critique of the idea of the language as kind of a manifestation of you know, all the discussion that was done, also the French for the reason that I'm there, all yeah. that was thinking about the characters of languages as embodying um, actually the, the force of the race, basically. Yeah. Because it is, it's a place where also reason has a lot to do, because obviously the mixture between body and, and mind that is put in the language. Yeah. The materiality is the, the ideal part of language. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, there, it's, you know, he says things like language that is reflective of, of a people, of, of the people, but it's not clear what, whether he means um, race there or whether he means just sort of culture, something like that. It's sort of um, a little bit unclear. I'm, I mean, I, I pointed out, I think, more about how um, he thinks um, language is reflective of the sort of hidden philosophy of a, of a culture, or sort of like uses of, of certain terms and so on. Um, but whether, uh, I mean, I guess it's how much pressure do you want to put on this idea that, uh, that language is reflective of, of the peoples, you know? Is, is that for him a racial um, category? Um, and then is that, a, Again, associated with these ideas about um, sort of certain races being disposed towards reason or not, right? That's that would be reflected in their language. Um, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to say. I mean, on the one hand, you can you can always say with Lichtenberg, it's just it's just unclear. And what's interesting about Lichtenberg though, is that it gives us this problem to think about. Rather than, giving us an answer to it. I think that <clears throat> what is particularly striking about the different levels, <clears throat> this kind of demolish of prejudice, this, uh, <clears throat> this view of about the Jewish people is so prejudiced. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think there is another instance of something like that in, in other fields of uh, thinking, of thinking, of thinking? Where, uh, where he's so adamantly and unreflectively uh, yeah. stereotyped? I mean, you see it a little bit in his, um, his writings on the slave trade, right? So, I yeah. mean, other, other instances of him being prejudiced towards um, <clears throat> towards certain cultures. Um, but whether that, that sort of prejudicial or knee-jerk reaction extends to, um, you know, his thinking about physics, for example, mm -hmm. or about language. Um, um, I don't think, I, I mean, I really don't, I, I can't think of instances where where that is true, where he's so unreflective. I mean, it's it's often you know you get sort of a two two opposing view, viewpoints that he's playing with and, and trying to understand how they they relate to one another um, as as a sort of way of, of being critical and reflective on those problems. Um, and and he's I mean there are other he's also very. He says a lot about about stereotypes, about how people's uses of stereotypes are reflected about That's the case of that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it's very strange. And I mean, I guess that's that's in part what um, 
what suggests to some people that it's just he became a grumpy old man at some point and is relying on these stereotypes and has just become unreflective. But I mean, it's, I suppose it's biographically interesting, but it's not so yeah. interesting as a sort of philosophical. <laughs> Please go on with the list, list, of course, list. First time, the first, uh, first place I have to apologize for my English, but I always say that. Uh, oh, there's a piece. Come, come here. Uh, oh, okay. Um, I have some handles here. The possibility of a total error on the foundation of, of transcendental philosophy. And the reason for this change is actually that, um, as uh, I was invited by Paolo to present here, uh, it was for me a big challenge because I'm not a, a Lichtenberg scholar, unlike Paolo and Stephen. So um, I have to figure out what to say here. And um, I was working on, on, on transcendental philosophy and the foundation of transcendental philosophy in the critique of pluralism. And reading some texts about uh, the relationship between Kant and Lichtenberg, I think I, I found a, a link between uh, my previous work and the, the interpretation that Kant had of Lichtenberg. I, I, I'm not claiming that I, I found it a link between Kant and Lichtenberg, but I think there is an interesting link between what Kant says about the, the impossibility of a total error in, in uh, mainly in the lectures on logic and some things that he uh, wrote about uh, Lichtenberg in the Opus Postulum. So, uh, that's the, the topic uh, about I'm going to speak. So um, the text begins with a large uh, quote of Hegel. I will skip the quote uh, because uh, for the sake of time, actually. Um, but I, I um, the, the quote is very important, important to me. I mean. Uh, I suppose uh, this is a quote uh, of uh, taking from uh, the introduction of the phenomenology of mind, uh, Hegel's phenomenology of mind, um, the two first paragraphs, and they are supposed to be uh, a sort of a critique of uh, Kant's uh, philosophy. Um, well, what is exactly the criticism? Um, well, as it is well known, the position of the critique of pure reason, uh, a text that Kant characterizes as carrying transcendental knowledge, 
that is uh, knowledge which refers not so much to objects but to our way of knowing them as this must be possible a priori, uh, seems to suppose that in order to show if metaphysics is possible, we must previously investigate what we can't know about how we know the objects, which is to investigate the sources, the scopes, and limits of knowledge that reason is capable of, independent of all experience. That is, in Hegel's words, it would be necessary, um, according to what he calls the natural conception of knowledge, uh, to investigate it if, if it is possible to know truth before finding it. That's the point of uh, Hegel's quote. In this search, in this research, Kant argues that the possibility of, of metaphysics as a science um, will be decided. The fourth mention assumes the assumption of a, of a hypothetical starting point that Kantian research usually characterizes with the expression Copernican term, although it has not been used by Kant. It, it will be investigated whether it does not go further in the explanation of the possibility of metaphysics as science in particular and as a priori knowledge in general, knowledge whose reality we already know by the existence of science that supposes it, assuming that our knowledge of things is not governed by objects so much, but by a component of anticip anticipate predictive nature provided by our subjectivity. The aforementioned establishes as a task the investigation of the same order in order to establish um, of the same sorry in order to establish that what to what extent these conditions allow but at the same time restrict our knowledge of objects and with this they are transformed into conditions of, of possibility of our subjectivity but only in so far as they are known and they are known under the way we know them now, the investigation of the source, scope, and limits of knowledge by means of pure reasons corresponds, according to Kant, to the establishment of a court in which the reasons analyze um, its aspirations to know a priori and decides whether they are adequate, a court which Kant himself calls critique of pure reason. Therefore, Hegel's proposal is directed just against this idea in so far as it seems to suppose that the type of knowledge which the reason would know about itself is possible. That is, the type of knowledge which takes place by means of the establishment of a court in which the reason analyzes itself and decides whether its own aspiration to know a priori are strict or not. The basic question addressed by Hegel against this proposal is related to the consistency of the proposal itself with a starting point which seems to be taken when showing its need. In fact, this starting point seems to be based on a suspicion, uh, in this case, the suspicion about the possibility of knowledge in metaphysics. This suspicion takes the form of a suspicion about our capacities to know the objects of metaphysics. If we are suspicious of our ability to know, at whatever level, the question is, to what extent can this suspicion be solved by, by appealing to the same capacity to know, for example, in the form of a court of in which the reason knows itself, which is, it is the judge, what is judged, and also the one that sets the standards with which it is judged. So that it is not better to assume that it is better to be suspicious of that suspicion and to attempt a completely different starting point like the one that Hegel attempts in the phenomenology of mind, and which is supposed without questioning knowledge, but to suppose its reality, analyzing its diverse manifestations, which includes the suspicion of the knowledge, of course, which, strictly speaking, it itself is not but a document of knowledge. Basically, the meaning of the, of the question can be paraphrased simply by appealing to the same way in which Kant raises the critical question. How to know in a court in which the instance, the judge, the judge, sorry, what is judge and the rules which they are judged um, with are at the same time, in a sense, that the trial conducted in an appropriate way, in an appropriate way, in another way. How can we know that the task of judging reason by itself has been satisfactorily carried out and it is not itself subject to errors? It is, at the bottom, a treatment directed at the first sight 
against any transcendental, transcendental proposal, at least of Kantian mark, insofar as it pretends to deal with the condition of possibility of knowledge, assuming that these conditions are cognoscible by means of a special type of knowledge, which has a different nature from the knowledge of objects. But just as the knowledge of objects is knowledge, and therefore to assume that some form of skepticism is acceptable regarding to knowledge in general, then it would be also be a subject of the same skepticism, at least prima facie. Hegel maintains, therefore, that the same attitude that leads Kant to sustain the need for, tra for a transcendental proposal should, should, to some extent, also lead him to maintain the need to question the same proposal, and therefore to make amends that this proposal cannot be maintained without critically taking charge of itself, a critical step which seems to involve the possibility of destruction of the proposal itself. So that's the content, to my view, of this uh, first text, the two first paragraph, paragraphs of the phenomenal knowledge of mind. Kant seems not to have seen this line of objection, which, as it is seen, it is quite deep, and if, if it succeeds, it will destroy the very foundations of transcendental philosophy, at least in the uh, version of the Critique of Pure Reason. In fact, if we review, for example, the prefaces of the Critique of Pure Reason, in which Kant raises all the methodical aspects of this work already commented, it seems that we will not find evidence which allows us to document in Kant a note of the problematic aspect that the explaining seems to be with, especially in relation to the question of the conditions of, of success, which would allow to ensure that the strangeness of what has been achieved through a transcendental approach. In spite of this, appearances can be deceptive. In this presentation, I will try to show that Kant did not only take into account the possibility of a proposal like the Hegelian one, but also tries to take charge of it in a way that, to some extent, cannot but connect with Hegel's own vision. And at the uh, end of my presentation, I will present a sort of link between this, between this solution and the interpretation that Kant had uh, of uh, Lichtenberg uh, idea, idea of transcendental philosophy because Kant uh, uh, sustains that uh, Lichtenberg um, had a sort of idea uh, of transcendental philosophy. Let us look in detail this point. In order to better understand this point, it is necessary to, to take a step back and go back to the passage in which Kant established for the first time the position which will lead him to maintain the need for criticism, a need whose accreditation is the aim of the passage in question. Let us revise it in detail. This is uh, the passage uh, of, uh, uh, taken from the very beginning of the Critique of Pure Reason, the second text. I will read it in English. Uh, you have the text in German. Um, human reason has this particular faith, this, this is uh, a non Jim Smith translation, that in one species of its knowledge it is burned by questions which, as prescri prescribed by the very nature of reason itself, it is not able to ignore, but which, as transcending all its power, it is also not able to answer. The perplexed perplexity into which it thus falls is not due to any fault of its own. It begins with principles which has no option save to employ in the course of experience, and which this experience at the same time abundantly justifies in, in it in using. Rising with their aid, since it is de determined to this also by its own nature, to be ever higher, ever more remote con conditions, it soon becomes aware that in this way, the question never ceasing, its work must always remain incomplete. And it, and it therefore finds itself compelled to restore the principles which oversteps all possible empirical employment, and which yet seems to, so unobjectionable that even ordinary consciousness really accepts them. But by this procedure, human reason precipitates itself into darkness and, contra and contradictions, and while it may indeed conjecture that this uh, must be in some way due to concealed errors, it is not in a position to be able to detect them. For since the principles of which it is making use transcend the limits of experience, they are no longer subject to any empirical test. The battlefield of these endless controversies is called metaphysics. End of the quote. 
This passage synthesizes a few of the central problems of the critic of the critic of pure reason. At the first sight, the text seems to reveal that the critic of pure reason deals with a form of error. However, it is not just any error, but rather one of particular characteristics, which therefore requires a strategy of peculiar nature to face it. Indeed, to begin with, it should be emphasized that a situation which could be called tragic, uh, at the same time paradoxical, is detected in this passage, which seems to indicate that here the error is not an error of ordinary nature. Kant tells us that human reason, a faculty of knowledge, has a special fate to ask questions that, by its very nature, cannot answer, also, or also uh, by its very nature. When these questions are asked because of its own constitution, the intentional oblivion of such questions, which Kant calls indifferentism, as, high, as highlighted below, is not an option for it, since metaphysics asks questions that the, that the human being seems unable to refuse to do. In other words, there would be some basis by which human wisdom could not stop drafting those questions exceeding its own capacity and that, on the other hand, leads it to error. This point is highlighted by Kant in different places where he takes charge of what he himself calls the metaphysics as a natural, metaphysics as a natural disposition, that is, a subject, as a subjective disposition that in some sense is anchorage in the very being of uh, of the human being and that, as such, it is inevitable in such a way that human being cannot renounce it, no matter if it is possible as a science is not accredited. Um, you can find this, for example, in the, in the, in, uh, the text 3 on Harvard. Metaphysics is necessary, its ground is reason which is never to be satisfied by critical concepts, reason finds neither satisfaction in the contemplation of things nor in the field of experience, with, uh, of experience that is in the world of senses. The concept of God and the immortality of the soul are two great driving forces, and reason has therefore come out of the field of the field of experience. End of the quote. Here it is interesting to note that metaphysics then arises from an element of a subjective or motivational nature. Um, which explains, in part, the trite fate of reason. But along with this, it must be emphasized that this inclina inclination has a particular nature since it leads to errors and contradictions based on the use of principles which are sufficiently, sufficiently confined by experience and are, in fact, conditions for it. The inclination of reason to find ever higher, higher conditions, ever more remote conditions, leads it to transcend the field of experience, seeking explanation for this, a transition which means its own failure. Indeed, these principles, valid and confirmed in experience, as we are told in the opening passage, passage of the Critique of Pure Reason, lead reason in the trans-empirical use of them to commit obscurities and contradictions, that is, producing just the opposite of what a cognitive faculty as reason must produce, in so far as the knowledge has to be true and the contradictions seem to be precisely characterized by the property of never being able to be true. What is shown here, to some extent, is the, is the paradoxical nature of the error committed by reason, since by exercising its own capacity it, can, it cannot succeed in producing the opposite of what this capacity is supposed to achieve, namely the error in its probably most evident form, the contradiction. In fact, it seems to be, in the case of contradiction, a type of error which cannot but appear as such. This fate is documented by, in the very history of metaphysics, which at first sight seems to have the structure of a compendium of contradictory opinions, and which therefore they all cannot be proved based on prima facie, plausible or, plausible or even confirmed principles in experience. The forementioned paradox is exacerbated by the fact that beyond being reason the one that by its very nature finds the production of contradictions as a fate and with this an epistemic format contrary to knowledge, it is, on the other hand, itself the one which detects the inadequate character of this situation, so that it is not, so to speak, in a state of complete error or error succinctly, 
but rather it is an error of which it is, in some sense, conscious. This allows it to suspend, so to speak, the validity of the metaphysical speculation. As a thing stand, reason seems to have, by its very nature, not only the condition which lead to its error, but the mechanism which allowed it to identify, at least at a certain level of development, that error as an error and as a consequence of it, of it to deactivate the self-hiding potential of the same, that, as we already know from Socrates, is where the, the greatest danger of error lies. Thus, Kant maintains that it is not only reason by its very nature errors insofar as by its very nature it asks questions that by its very nature can it respond, but by its very nature it also possesses the capacity to catch error and also is able, at least to some extent, get over it. It is noteworthy that this complex structure has a high interest from the contemporary perspective. Although it is, it is a not paradoxical situation of the type of that which generates the most, the most commonly treated sense of self-deception in the philosophical literature, at least at the present time, and although error at the beginning of the critic of pure reason has a highly qualified nature, error itself presents us as Kant leaves difficulties of a similar nature to those, to those present, presented by self-deception at least as a phenomenon whose explanation, as Davidson, for example, indicates, is extremely complex since it requires an account from a normative or rational point of view, um, if you will, of a phenomenon that is precisely characterized by its divine character of the norm that it serves for to some extent practicing of it. In this measure, like all forms of irrationality, the error of the type of self-deception, like, like one which the reason seems to commit in this case, is an error in the house of reason, to use the Davidsonian expression. You can find this idea uh, of error in the house of reason in the in, uh, uh, text uh, number four. Now, according to Kant, this characteristic of being divine from the norm, of being deprivation, or, or, uh, we could say, and therefore a phenomenon of, of parasitic, parasitic character of a metaphysical error is to some extent shared with other forms of error to the extent that it seems to be, in general, a phenomenon of such nature. This note of error, or at least of the other variants of the same, not only of the philosophical or, or metaphysical error that can be interesting in the, uh, in the critic of pure reason, is in fact something about which calls the attention the, about which calls the attention of Kant in different places, making see that even the explanation of the possibility of it shows a great difficulty, just in so far as it is a phenomenon of, of deprivation and that, therefore, supposes not only the clarification of the faculty regarding to which it is deprivation, but also of the condition under which it is possible that did fast did that this faculty, in its exercise, can fail. Therefore, it could be said, be exercised at the same time, not to be exercised. This is, for example, what Kant, Kant indicated in the Yeshe Logik, uh, in text uh, uh, 5, um, where he speaks about the uh, uh, error in the formal sense of the logic. He uh, says here that uh, to explain error to a certain point is more difficult than to, to explain the possibility of truth. Um, beyond the difficulties of, of uh, that uh, this passage of the Yeshi Logik seems to generate, especially regarding the interpretation of the idea of error in a formal sense, and its difference with an eventual material sense, which could be recognized from here, it's clear, uh, it seems that, that, that the uh, the error, at least in the form that can be, is interesting in dealing with, is characterized as a form of deprivation. This will be at the basis of the understanding uh, of the outstanding doctrine of the impossibility of total error, which I uh, will deal with below. Um, I, I believe with, uh, the, uh, with this deal of uh, the doctrine of the impossibility of total error. The fact that error, error is divine from the norm seems to be precisely what is at the basis of the fact that Kant sustains the striking doctrine according to which total error would be impossible. There are many uh, passages in, um, 
in uh, mainly in, in lectures on logic uh, where we can find uh, this idea. A doctrine that in turn seems to lie at the basis of the initial diagnosis of the critique of pure reason, that is, the fact that reason is capable of being itself the one discovering the way in which the contradiction its own exercise commits is resolved. Indeed, it is precisely the possibility of total error which invalidates the need to be suspicious of the suspicion, which exactly generates the constant contradiction of reason with itself documented in the history of metaphysics. It is also this impossibility that allows the reason itself to detect the error as such, and therefore, that it, at least, to be able to identify it, the first step necessary for its deactivation. Now, if the idea that I present here is correct, it is striking that the idea of the impossibility of, a, of total error has not been treated in, lit, in literature except by a couple of authors. I, I have found just two treatments in literature, the one, uh, one text of uh, Norbert Kinski and the other of uh, Wolfgang Wiener. Um, because it would be part of the key to respond to the position, the position of Hegel and in general to raise questions that, that create doubts about the possibility of transcendental discourse, at least in a Kantian interpretation of this uh, of, of transcendental discourse. And this is very important because I, I think if uh, this is correct, it, it, uh, uh, it is also shown that the uh, traditional phenomenological interpretation of uh, Kant's transcendental uh, uh, methodology, methodology is false. I mean, but Kant uh, will not is, is not in this reading a sort of uh, phenomenologist of a letter. Um, to better understand this doctrine, let us see more in the intensive passages in which Kant is presented. Uh, they are passages 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, 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 11, and 12. Um, I'm not reading this, uh, I, I skip uh, the passages because we will uh, take too much time. Um, first of all, it should be noted that the idea of the practicing nature of, er of error is not Kantian but has a long history um, and was sustained emphatically by many authors in the um, 18th uh, century. Uh, Robert Hinsky, for example, uh, interestingly, interestingly discussed the conceptions of Wolf and Lambert, for example. Um, the latter having a structural connection in the background with Kant's position. However, as noted by Kant, Kant seems to have been the first to place this impossibility, namely the impossibility of total error, as a logical impossibility as it can be seen in text 8. Um, there are many, uh, there are at least one uh, uh, passage in the Critique of Pure Reason uh, where we can find the same idea. Uh, here, Kant is based on the idea that error, in the form of, ha of uh, having the false as true, can only take place in the judgment <laughs> as the place of truth, truth and falseness. In fact, that is, that is to turn an idea, on the other hand, for example, that there is an anti-predicative anti sphere in which error is impossible as long as the sensible contact with the object would not be uh, falsible, is not the idea that Kant here sustain. It is not the path in which Kant holds his idea of the impossibility of total error, because although Kant holds similar thoughts, his thesis on this type of phenomena is that the sensibility does not error, because just with it there would be no, no judgment, where uh, the judgment has to be considered as the place of truth. With this, the possibilities of finding space for an anti-predicative interpretation of, or pre-predicative of the truth that, as it is known, has been habitual in the classical philosophical tradition as well as in the, as well as in the phenomenology, apparently, although by this I do not mean that Kant does not identify fields of monovalence, for example, the case of uh, the judgment of uh, perception would be, it seems to happen, however, that this field is always situated in, the, in, the, in, in another field. Uh, apparently, as I said, seems to be uh, close in the case of Kant, 
maybe this uh, possibility uh, to link uh, the kind of interpretation of the uh, impossibility of total error with, uh, with the phenomenological tradition. The Kantian argument about the possibility of total error seems to be made cumulatively an opinion to different reasons, especially in different versions of his lectures on, lectures on logic, but also in his concrete and legacy known as reflections. Because of this, we do not find a single argument or a unitary treatment of the matter, although it seems to me that in systematic terms several of the reasons, several of the reasons which Kant appeals to are reduced to a certain easily identifiable basic core. A first argument given by Kant is of a negative nature and points to the fact that uh, of the hermetic, hermetic nature which such an error would acquire if possible. Indeed, if total error is possible, neither my own thought nor others would constitute a possible criterion of truth. That is, for example, the idea in text 12. Since it would always be possible for any observation about the detection of an error to be an error itself, and thus to be the infinite, which seems to finally have the cancellation of rationality, of dialogue and the common search for proof, as a risk, and also the impossibility to take charge of their own fault on the part of reason. But in fact, the same identification of error as such, identification that de facto seems to be having, is in some sense an indication that error is not irreductible hermetic, but rather the other way around. We have criteria which allows which allow us to identify the error as such, that is the same uh, as in the very beginning of the of pure reason. We are capable to uh, 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 human reason uh, uh, makes uh, uh, or, or uh, commits errors, but is also capable to identificate uh, those errors as such. Um, this is relevant because it seems that every skeptical exercise as such supposes at least the ability to distinguish one argument as failed and the if so, at least certain forms of error as such. So that the skeptical exercise itself would suppose that total error is impossible. This would be do nothing but a document a scale the unsatisfactory nature of every merely negative form of, of skepticism. In fact, it seems that the very motivation of the exercise Kant wants to perform in the critique of pure reason arises, at least partially, from the detection of the error, so that the error itself, to some degree, that suspicion, supposed certain, certain basic opposing criteria of trust. In this sense, the logic of being suspicion of the suspicion is not simply iterable, but at least has a certain interpretation uh, of the rationality, which is precisely what allows an exercise of this nature. Thus, when asked about how it is, how it is possible to know whether a reason performs well the task of analyzing itself, the answer cannot be, at least in part, but we know that to the, to the extent that it fulfills the same criteria that were not fulfilled when the suspicion that motivated such examination was generated. Um, the aforementioned, seems to, since it seems to me, is evidently clear at the moment when Kant, uh, at the moment when Kant introduces the imitation of the natural science as, and the curious and unfortunately little treated idea of the pure reason experiment, which he introduces precisely by demonstrating the exemplary differentiation and methodological consciousness which, which still today distinguish Kant from most philosophers the basic low-level methodological conviction which would consider the task, the task of critique of, of pure reason as well done task. That is what you can find in text 13. I mean, this idea that the uh, critique of pure reason imitates the method of the uh, natural science. And I think what uh, Kant introduces there is the, is, uh, our not least, uh, the, uh, not less of the uh, uh, methodological constrictions which must be fulfilled in order to uh, prove that the uh, enterprise uh, taking the critic of pure reason is well done, is a well done task. I, I, uh, I'm not reading the passage because it's too long, but you can find it in, in, uh, you can read it uh, uh, in, on, on the handout. 
This passage, revealing a higher le level uh, of method, presents precisely the basic condition under which the task of criticism has to be considered as well as executed. These conditions are summarized ultimately in the idea of the critic of pure reason resolving the situation of contradiction, contradiction with itself that the reason would commit following their own inclinations. The aforementioned it would be achieved by assuming a hypothesis, the Copernican hypothesis, whose consequences is precisely the distinction between, between two perspectives on which does not one which, sorry, does not include the critical distinction between phenomena and things in themselves, a perspective which does not get over the contradiction of reason with itself, and another, and another freed of the own Copernical hypothesis, which includes that distinction and thus gets over the, the contradiction. Thus, the criteria of solution of the conflict in Critic of Pure Reason clearly respond to its criteria of motivation. It was contradiction what uh, uh, motivated the critique of pure reason, and it is the uh, resolution of contradiction what responds uh, uh, the conflict in critique of pure reason. I think that the aforementioned also explains a relevant point of the philosophy of Kant whose importance is often literally understood, namely the, Kant the Kantian obsession for completeness. Many times Kant's insistence on the completeness of rational structures shown in the critique of pure reason or in other works is perceived as an unjustified obsession or as a kind of idiosyncratic belief based on an optimist, optimist, op optimistic uh, view regarding the possibilities of reason. Without affirming that Kantian conception of rationality has no problem or features or unsat unsatisfactory elements, it seems to me that such a, such a vision ignores the, si the systematic elements at the basis of, the, of this Kant's architectonic ideas and concerns as long as the critique of pure reason supposed just a kind of basic conception of rationality considered as the basis of it in so far as, as in part of the structure motivating the criticism, the criticism itself. The Kantian concern for completeness is a reflection of the, of the concern about accounting for the Hegelian problem to the extent that through such completeness it would be shown that criticism allowed to take the reason to a situation of peace with itself if you want to resolve the conflict that criticism tried to solve, and this in such a way that the given explanation is organic. Thus, the completeness of the investigation is, is explicitly introduced by Kant as, as a sign of correction, as indicated in, in the first preface. You can see thus the, the, it on text uh, 14. The aforementioned, it seems to me, explains not only the Kantian obsession regarding completeness, but also Hegel's insistence on highlighting its absence. Think, for example, of the critical observation on the completeness in the table of, uh, 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 concerning the table of categories already in the phenomenology of mind. Hegel once more in this regard understood Kant better than uh, a good part of posterity. A second argument against the idea of total error has also a structural nature and is to some extent related to the previous one. If the place of error is, is judgment, Kant argues the total error is something like that happened um, the total error is impossible because, uh, because judgment is the work of the understanding, so that the judgment is, so to speak, its operation, that is, the proper activity of this faculty through which we know its character, while the total error is just what would be totally removed from, from an operation of that nature. You can see that in text, in text 9. That is why Kant says that in every judgment there must be always something true. That's uh, text 6. As it can be seen here, again, Kant gives an account of his judicative formal conception of the impossibility of total error. To err implies to judge, but to judge is an act of understanding and an, and an act in relation to which the same judging must respect the rules, conditions for the act to take place. Total error would accomplish and not accomplish such rules, which is the reason why it would be impossible. As it can be seen, Kant, again, Kant, Kant appeals here to the basic structure of rationality, which seems to be at the basis of the very discovery of error as such. The same can be said 
uh, to which Kanzi usually appeals uh, for all the reason, namely, the total error would entail the possibility of knowledge in so far as within the with in all possible criteria of truth will uh, would become blurred. And now I'm um, coming to my conclusion and the link to Lichtenberg. Um, or actually can't speak to that. <laughs> um, if what has been said above is correct, it seems to me that it's clear that Kant's strategy in the critique of purism does not differ radically from what Hegel himself assumes in the phenomenology of mind. Both suppose a certain interpretation of skepticism, namely, or that is, of the suspicion which cannot be considered in the words of Hegel as merely negative, but which must be must assume the particular nature which there would be in the skeptical denial, denial of the possibility of certain knowledge. The classic Kantian game between limitating conditions and at the same time enabling knowledge seems to suggest, suggest the aforementioned. I think, for example, about the relationship between empirical reality and transcendental identity. Thus, although Kant, unlike Hegel, does not deal with the problem of the condition of possibility of his own discourse in detail, he does seem to have taken charge of this subject, as I think it has been shown here, at least in Tente Obligua. I believe he has achieved the aforementioned, showing a degree of important rhetorical sophistication, showing his uh, his work not only from an original and innovative perspective of a method that must be followed in philosophy, but also setting explicitly and cons consensual constrictions that we could call metamethodics, which give an account of the correction criter criteria of the exercise carried out with the guidance of the method or of the supposed hypothesis, completeness, absence of contradiction, where there was a contradiction before, etc. Part of this, Kant having taken charge of the Hegelian problem, um, that is the problem of the possibility of a proposal such as that of the transcendental philosophy, is included in, this, in his conception of the impossibility of total error, which, as I hope to have shown, has a crucial systematic relevance. Relevance uh, which I think most interpreters uh, didn't uh, or haven't seen till now. But Kant's reflection on the possibility of transcendental philosophy are not only found of Albert Sorbonne in the aforementioned text. As it is well known, the late Kant returns to, the, to, to this problem the so called opus postum, where he offers no less than 150 attempts to define transcendental philosophy. In such attempts, Kant constantly quotes Lichtenberg, whom he attributes, attributes a conception of transcendental philosophy. We know that Kant read the second volume of Lichtenberg's Verschmitten Schriften, published uh, uh, before Kant's uh, death, which contained commentaries to Kant's work. Kant wrote in a note on the margin of, this, of his copy that Lichten, Lichtenberg's philosophy would be a form of reiner idealism, pure idealism, that is reflection 6369. Despite the pure idealism of Lichtenberg, or perhaps be because of it, Kant seems to have found inspiring ideas in Lichtenberg's text. Lichtenberg would be pure ide idealism, like Hegel's uh, philosophy, I would, say. I would say. Some of them seems to, th that is for Kant, I, I, I'm not suggesting that is the real Lichtenberg. Um, some of them seems to suggest a kind of continuation of the tendency already manifested in the critique of seeing in the completeness and self-constituting character of reason, based on its own norm, the key to transcendental philosophy. Kant writes, for example, that, I quote this taken in, in turn, the transcendental philosophy nach Lichtenberg's Idee, ein reiner Vernunftacht, nicht empirisch wahrzunehmende Produkt, sondern ein System, was wodurch die Vernunft sich selbst macht. Und das wäre nicht dabei. In a text in which a large part of the key question of fundamental metaphilosophy is done, Kant refers to the name Lichtenberg almost an, as an abbreviated response to them. This is a very interesting text because he uh, here makes very important questions regarding the possibility of transcendental philosophy, and the answer is Lichtenberg. 
Ähm, aus welchen Bestimmungen des Vorstellungsvermögens entspringt das System und kann die Vollständigkeit der Elemente des Zentrums gebildet werden, indem man jenes in uns a priori befindliche Ganze analysiert und das Formal desselben aus, eigene, aus seiner eigenen Vernunft entwickelt? Das ist die äh, the Question. Uh, uh, concerning the, 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 the uh, um, common element uh, from them are uh, all the uh, 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 capacities to represent good uh, 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 or where the uh, most uh, capacities of uh, knowledge could find uh, its origins and the answer to this question is just the name of Lichtenberg. Yeah. Um, I think that this text seems to show us that the waste of Kant's work, this waste is, I suppose, uh, that is the name I give uh, the Opus Postulum, the waste of Kant's work can only be interpreted, interpreted from the waste of Lichtenberg, yeah, the, uh, the Sudanbücher. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Discussing <coughs> with this uh, communication. So please. Say that, um, yeah, right. One could say that there is a sort of misunderstanding there. That is, it is actually what the, uh, most of interpreters uh, uh, comment mm -hmm. uh, about this this passage. Uh, I think, for example, of uh, uh, of uh, Ludwig Sieg, for example, and. Uh, he even says something like, 
Well, as an interpretation of Kant's philosophy, this is so mistaken that it cannot uh, foresee the principles of which it is making use transcending the limits of experience, they are no longer subject to any empirical test. The battlefield of these endless controversies is called metaphysics. End of the quote. This passage synthesizes as few the central problem of the critic of the critic of purism. At the first sight, the text seems to reveal that the critic of purism deals with a form of error. However, it is not just any error but rather one of particular characteristics, which therefore requires a strategy of peculiar nature to face it. Indeed, to begin with, it should be emphasized that a situation which could be called tragic, uh, at the same time paradoxical, is detected in this passage, which seems to indicate that here the error is not an error of ordinary nature. Kant tells us that human reason, a faculty of knowledge, has a special fate to ask questions that, by its very nature, cannot answer, also, or also uh, by its very nature. When these questions are asked because of its own constitution, the intentional oblivion of such questions, which Kant calls indifferentism, as, high, as highlighted below, is not an option for it, since metaphysics asks questions that the, that the human being seems unable to refuse to do. In other words, there would be some basis by which human reason could not stop drafting those questions exceeding its own capacity and that, on the other hand, leads it to error. This point is highlighted by Kant in different places where he takes charge of what he himself calls the metaphysics as a natural, metaphysics as a natural disposition, that is, a subject, as a subjective disposition that in some sense is encouraged in the very being of, uh, of the human being and that as such it is inevitable in such a way that human being cannot renounce it no matter if it is possible as a science is not accredited. Um, you can find this for example in the, in the, in, uh, the text 3 on how. Metaphysics is necessary, it grounds reason which is never to be satisfied by empirical concepts. Reason finds neither satisfaction in the contemplation of things nor in the field of experience, with, uh, of experience that is in the world of senses. The concept of God and the immortality of the soul are two great driving forces and reason has to form come out of the field of the field of experience. End of the world. Here it is interesting to note that metaphysics then arises from an element of a subjective or multinational nature, um, which explains in part the trite fate of reason. But along with this, it must be emphasized that this inclina inclination has a particular nature since it leads to errors and contradictions based on the use of principles which are sufficiently, sufficiently confined by experience and are in fact conditions for it. The inclination of reason to find ever higher, higher conditions, ever more remote conditions, leads it to, to transcend the field of experience, seeking explanation for this, a transition which means its own failure. Indeed, these principles, valid and confirmed in experience, as we are told in the opening passage, passage of the Critique of Pure Reason, lead reason in the transempirical use of them to commit obscurities and contradictions, that is, producing just the opposite of what a cognitive faculty as reason must produce, in so far as the knowledge has to be true and the contradictions seem to be precisely characterized by the property of never being able to be true. What is shown here, to some extent, is the, is the paradoxical nature of the error committed by reason since by exercising its own capacity it can it cannot succeed in producing the opposite of what this capacity is supposed to achieve namely the error in its probably most evident form the contradiction in fact it seems to be in the case of contradiction a type of error which cannot but appear as such this fate is documented by in the very history of metaphysics, which at first sight seems to have the structure of a compendium of contradictory opinions, and which therefore they all cannot be proved based on prima facie plausible or plausible or even confirmed principles in experience. 
The aforementioned paradox is exacerbated, exacerbated by the fact that beyond the reason the one that by its very nature finds the production of contradictions as a fate and with this an epistemic format contrary to knowledge, it is, on the other hand, itself the one which detects the inadequate character of this situation, so that it is not, so to speak, in a state of complete error or error succinctly, but rather it is an error of which it is, in some sense, conscious. This allows it to suspend, so to speak, the validity of the metaphysical speculation. As a thing stand, reason seems to have, by its very nature, not only the condition which lead to its error, but the mechanism which allowed it to identify, at least at a certain level of development, that error as an error and as a consequence of it, of it to deactivate the self-hiding potential of the same, that, as we already know from Socrates, is where the, the greatest danger of error lies. Thus, Kant maintains that it is not only reason by its very nature errs insofar as by its very nature it asks questions that by its very nature can it respond, but by its very nature it also possesses the capacity to catch error and also is able, at least to some extent, get over it. It is noteworthy that this complex structure has a high interest from the contemporary perspective. Although it is, it is a non paradoxical situation of the type of that which generates the most, the most commonly treated sense of self deception in the philosophical literature, at least at the present time, and although error at the beginning of the critic of pure reason has a highly qualified nature, error itself presents us as can be its difficulties of a similar nature to those, to those present, presented by self-deception, at least as a phenomenon whose explanation, as Davidson, for example, indicates, is extremely complex since it requires an account from a normative or rational point of view, um, if you will, of a phenomenon that is precisely characterized by its divine character of the norm that it's therefore to some extent paratistic of it. In this measure, like all forms of irrationality, the error of the type of self-deception, like, like one which the reason seems to commit in this case, is an error in the house of reason, to use the Davidsonian expression. You can find this idea uh, of error in the house of reason in the in, uh, uh, text uh, number four. Now, according to Kant, this characteristic of being divine from the norm, of being deprivation, or, or uh, we could say, and therefore a phenomenon of, of parasitic, parasitic character, of a metaphysical error, is to some extent shared with other forms of error, to the extent that it seems to be, in general, a phenomenon of such nature. This mode of error, or at least of the other variants of the same, not only of the philosophical or, or metaphysical error that can be interested in the, uh, in the critic of pure reason, is in fact something about which calls the attention, the, about which calls the attention of Kant in different places, making see that even the explanation of the possibility of it shows a great difficulty. Just in so far as it is a phenomenon of, of deprivation, and that, therefore, supposes not only the clarification of the faculty regarding to which it is deprivation, but also of the condition under which it is possible that this, that this faculty, in its exercise, can fail. Therefore, it could be said, be exercised at the same time not to be exercised. This is, for example, what Kant, Kant indicated in the Yeshi Logik, uh, in text uh, uh, 5, um, where he speaks about the uh, of error in the formal sense of it. He uh, says here that uh, to explain error to a certain point is more difficult than to, to explain the possibility of truth. Um, beyond the difficulties of, of uh, that, uh, this passage of the Yeshi Logik seems to generate, especially regarding the interpretation of the idea of error in a formal sense, and its difference with an eventual material sense, which could be recognized from here, it's clear, uh, it seems, that, that, that uh, the error that leads in the form that can be, is interesting in dealing with is characterized as a form of deprivation. This will be at the basis of the understanding uh, 
of the outstanding doctrine of the impossibility of total error, which I uh, will deal with below. And I, I begin with, uh, the, uh, with this theme of uh, the doctrine of the impossibility of total error. The fact that the error, error is divine from the norm seems to be precisely what is at the basis of the fact that Kant sustains the striking doctrine according to which total error would be impossible. There are many uh, passages in, um, in uh, mainly in, in lectures on logic uh, where we can find uh, this idea. A doctrine that, in turn, seems to lie at the basis of the initial diagnosis of the critic of pure reason, that is, the fact that reason is capable of being itself the one discovering the way in which the contradiction its own exercise commits is resolved. Indeed, it is precisely the impossibility of total error which invalidates the need to be suspicious of the suspicion, which exactly generates the constant contradiction of reason with itself documented in the history of metaphysics. It is also this impossibility that allows the reason itself to detect the error as such, and therefore, that it, at least, to be able to identify it, the first step necessary for its deactivation. Now, if the idea that I present here is correct, it is striking that the idea of the impossibility of, a, of total error has not been treated in, it, in literature except by a couple of authors. I, I have found just two treatments in literature, the one, uh, one text of uh, Norbert Kinski and the other of uh, Wolfgang Wiener. Um, because it will be part of the key to respond to the position, the position of Hegel and, in general, to raise questions they, that create doubts about the possibility of transcendental discourse, at least in a Kantian interpretation of this uh, of, of transcendental discourse. And this is very important because I, I think if uh, this is correct, it, it, uh, um, it is also shown that the uh, traditional phenomenological interpretation of uh, Kant's transcendental uh, uh, methodology, methodology is false. I mean, but Kant uh, will not, is, is not in this reading a sort of uh, phenomenologist of the letter. Um, to better understand this doctrine, let us see more in the general passages in which Kant is presented. This, uh, they are passages 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, 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 11, and 12. Um, I'm not reading this, uh, I, I skip uh, the passages because we need it uh, will take too much time. Uh, First of all, it should be noted that the idea of the participator of, er of error is not Kantian, but has a long history um, and was sustained emphatically by many authors in the um, 18th century. Uh, Robert Hinsky, for example, uh, interestingly, interestingly discussed the conceptions of Boyce and Lambert, for example, um, the latter having a structural connection in the background with Kant's position. However, as an old by Kant seems to have been the first to place this impossibility, namely the impossibility of total error, as a logical impossibility as it can be seen in text 8. Um, there are many, uh, there are at least one uh, uh, passage in the Critique of Pure Reason uh, where we can find the same idea. Uh, here, Kant is based on the idea that error, in the form of, ha of uh, having the false as true, can only take place in the judgment <laughs> as the place of truth, truth and falseness. In fact, there is, there is the common idea, on the other hand, for example, that there is an anti-predicative anti sphere in which error is impossible as long as the sensible contact with the object would not be uh, falsible, is not the idea that Kant here sustain. It is not the path in which Kant holds his idea of the impossibility of total error, because although Kant holds similar thoughts, his thesis on this type of phenomena is that the sensibility does not error, because just with it there will be no, no judgment, where uh, the judgment has to be considered as the place of truth. With this, the possibilities of finding space for an anti-predicative interpretation of, or pre-predicative of the truth that, as it is known, has been habitual in the 
classical philosophical tradition as well as in the as well as in the phenomenology, apparently, apparently, although by this I do not mean that Kant does not identify fields of monovalence, for example, the case of uh, the judgment of, uh, of perception would be, it seems to happen, however, that this field is always situated in the, in the, in, in another field. Uh, apparently, as I said, it seems to be uh, closed in the case of Kant, maybe this uh, possibility uh, to link uh, the Kantian interpretation of the uh, uh, impossibility of total error with, uh, with the phenomenological tradition. The Kantian argument about the impossibility of total error seems to be made cum cumulatively and appealing to different reasons, especially in different versions of his lectures on, lectures on logic, but also in his kind of reading legacy known as reflections. Because of this, we do not find a single argument or a unitary treatment of the matter, although it seems to me that in systematic terms several of the reasons, several of the reasons which Kant appeals to are reduced to a certain easily identifiable basic core. A first argument given by Kant is of a negative nature and points to the fact that uh, of the hermetic, hermetic nature which such an error would acquire if possible. Indeed, if total error is possible, neither my own thought nor others would constitute a possible criterion of truth. That is, for example, the idea in text 12. Since it would always be possible for any observation about the detection of an error to be an error itself, and thus to be the infinite, which seems to finally have the cancellation of rationality, of dialogue, and the common search for proof, as a risk, and there is also the impossibility to take charge of their own fault on the part of reason. But in fact, the same identification of error as such, identification that de facto seems to be having, is in some sense an indication that error is not irreductible hermetic, but rather the other way around. We have criteria which allows which allow us to identify the error as such, that is the same uh, as in the very beginning of the of pure reason. We are capable to uh, uh, and human reason uh, uh, makes uh, uh, or, or uh, commits errors, but is also capable to identificate uh, those errors as such. Um, this is relevant because it seems that every skeptical exercise as such supposes at least the ability to distinguish one argument as failed and the if so, at least certain forms of error as such so that the skeptical exercise itself would suppose that total error is impossible. This would be do nothing but a document a scale of the unsatisfactory nature of every merely negative form of, of skepticism. In fact, it seems that the very motivation of the exercise Kant wants to perform in the, in the critique of pure reason arises, at least partially, from the detection of the error, so that the error itself, to some degree, that suspicion, supposed certain, certain basic opposing criteria of trust. In this sense, the logic of being suspicion of the suspicion is not simply iterable, but at least has a certain interpretation uh, of the rationality, which is precisely what allows an exercise of this nature. Thus, when asked about how it is how it is possible to know whether a reason performs well the task of analyzing itself, the answer cannot be, at least in part, but we know that to the to the extent that it fulfills the same criteria that were not fulfilled when the suspicion that motivated such examination was generated. Um, the aforementioned, seems to, since it seems to me, is evidently clear at the moment when Kant, uh, at the moment when Kant introduces the imitation of the natural science as, and the curious and unfortunately little treated idea of the pure reason experiment, which he introduces precisely by demonstrating the exemplary differentiation and methodological consciousness which, which still today distinguish Kant from most philosophers the basic low-level methodological conviction which would consider the task, the task of critique of, of pure reason as well done the task. That is what you can find in text 13. I mean, this idea that the uh, critique of pure reason imitates the method of the uh, natural science. And I think 
what uh, Kant introduces there is the is uh, are not least uh, uh, not less of the uh, uh, methodological constrictions which must be fulfilled in order to uh, prove that the uh, enterprise uh, taking the critic of purism is well done is a well done task. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm not reading the passage because it's too long, but you can find it in the, uh, you, you can read it uh, uh, in, on, on the handout. This passage, revealing a higher level, level uh, method of method, presents precisely the basic condition under which the task of criticism has to be considered as well as executed. These conditions are summarized ultimately in the idea of the critic of pure reason resolving the situation of contradiction, contradiction with itself that the reason would commit following their own inclinations. The aforementioned it would be achieved by assuming a hypothesis, the Copernican hypothesis, whose consequences is precisely the distinction between, between two perspectives on which does not one which sorry does not include the critical distinction between phenomena and things in themselves a perspective which does not get over the contradiction of reason with itself, and another, and another freed of the own Copernican hypothesis, which includes that distinction and thus gets over the, the contradiction. Thus, the criteria of solution of the conflict in Critic of Pure Reason clearly respond to its criteria of motivation. It was contradiction what uh, uh, motivated the Critic of Pure Reason, and it is the uh, resolution of contradiction, what responds uh, uh, the conflict in critical theories. I think that the aforementioned also explains a relevant point of the philosophy of Kant whose importance is often literally understood, namely the, Kant the Kantian obsession for completeness. Many times Kant's insistence on the completeness of rational structures shown in the critique of theorism or in other works is perceived as an unjustified obsession or as a kind of idiosyncratic belief based on an optimist, optimistic, optimistic uh, view regarding the possibilities of reason. Without affirming that Kantian conception of rationality has no problem or features or unsatisfactory elements, it seems to me that such a, such a vision ignores the, the systematic elements at the basis of, the, of this Kant's architectonic ideas and concerns as long as the critique of pure reason supposed just a kind of like, basic conception of rationality considered as the basis of its result for us as in part of the structure motivating the criticism, the criticism itself. The Kantian concern for completeness is a reflection of the, of the concern about accounting for the Hegelian problem to the extent that through such completeness it would be shown that criticism allowed to take the reason to a situation of peace with itself if you want to resolve the conflict that criticism tried to solve, and this in such a way that the given explanation is organic. Thus, the completeness of the investigation is, is explicitly introduced by Kant as, as a sign of correction, as indicated in, in the first preface. You can see thus the, the, it on text uh, 14. The aforementioned, it seems to me, explains not only the Kantian obsession regarding completeness, but also Hegel's insistence on highlighting its absence. Think, for example, of the critical observation on the completeness in the table of, uh, uh, concerning the table of categories already in the phenomenology of mind. Hegel once more in this regard understood Kant better than uh, a good part of posterity. A second argument against the idea of total error has also a structural nature and is to some extent related to the previous one. If the place of error is, is judgment, Kant argues the total error is something like that happened um, the total error is impossible without, because uh, because judgment is the work of the understanding, so that the judgment is, so to speak, its operation. That is the proper activity of this faculty through which we know its character. While the total error is just what would be totally removed from from an operation of that nature. You can see that in text even text nine. That is why Kant says that in every judgment there must be always something true. That's uh, text 6. As it can be seen here, again, Kant gives an account of his judicative formal conception of the impossibility of total error. To err implies to judge, 
but to judge is an act of understanding and an, and an act in relation to which the same judging must respect the rules, conditions for the act to take place. Total error will accomplish and not accomplish such rules, which is the reason why it would be impossible. As it can be seen, can and again, Kant, Kant appeals here to the basic structure of rationality, which seems to be at the basis of the very discovery of error as such. The same can be said uh, to which Kant usually appeals uh, for all the reason, namely, the total error would entail the possibility of knowledge in so far as within the with in all possible criteria of truth will uh, would become blurred. And now I'm um, coming to my conclusion and the link to Lichtenberg. Um, or actually, can't speak to that. <laughs> um, if what has been said above is correct, it seems to me that it's clear that Kant's strategy in the critique of pure reason does not differ radically from what Hegel himself assumes in the phenomenology of mind. Both suppose a certain interpretation of skepticism, namely, or that is, of the suspicion, which cannot be considered in the words of Hegel as merely negative, but which must be must assume the particular nature which there would be in the skeptical denial, denial of the possibility of certain knowledge. The classic Kantian game between limitating conditions and at the same time enabling knowledge seems to suggest, suggest the aforementioned. I think, for example, about the relationship between empirical reality and transcendental identity. Thus, although Kant, unlike Hegel, does not deal with the problem of the condition of possibility of his own discourse in detail, he does seem to have taken charge of this subject, as I think it has been shown here, at least in Intelio Bigua. I believe he has achieved the aforementioned, showing a degree of important methodical sophistication, showing his uh, his work not only from an original and innovative perspective of a method that must be followed in philosophy, but also setting explicitly and cons concentric constrictions that we could call metamethodics, which give an account of the correction criter criteria of the exercise carried out with the guidance of the method or of the supposed hypothesis, completeness, absence of contradiction, where there was a contradiction before, etc. Part of this, Kant having taken charge of the Hegelian problem, um, that is the problem of the possibility of a proposal such as that of the transcendental philosophy, is included in, this, in his conception of the impossibility of total error, which, as I hope to have shown, has a crucial systematic relevance. Relevance uh, which I think most interpreters uh, didn't uh, or haven't seen till now. But Kant's reflection on the possibility of transcendental philosophy are not only found albeit subjectively in the aforementioned text. As it is well known, the late Kant returns to, the, to, to this problem the so-called opus postum, where he offers no less than 150 attempts to define transcendental philosophy. In such attempts, Kant constantly quotes Lichtenberg, whom he attributes, attributes a conception of transcendental philosophy. We know that Kant read the second volume of Lichtenberg's Verschmitten Schriften, published uh, uh, before Kant's uh, death, which contain commentaries to Kant's work. Kant wrote in a note on the margin of, this, of his copy that Lichten, Lichtenberg's philosophy would be a form of reiner idealism, pure idealism, that is reflection 6369. Despite the pure idealism of Lichtenberg, or perhaps be because of it, Kant seems to have found inspiring ideas in Lichtenberg's text. Look, Lichtenberg would be pure ide idealism, like Hegel's uh, philosophy, I would, say, I would say. Some of them seems to, th that is for Kant, I, I, I'm not suggesting that is the real Lichtenberg. Um, some of them seems to suggest a kind of continuation of the tendency already manifested in the critique of seeing in the completeness and self-constituting character of reason, based on its own norm, the key to transcendental philosophy. Kant writes, for example, that, like what is taken in, in turn, the transcendental philosophy in Nach Lichtenberg's Idee, ein reiner Vernunftacht, nicht empirisch wahrzunehmende Produkt, sondern ein System, was wodurch die Vernunft sich selbst macht. 
und das wäre nicht der Fall. In a text in which a large part of the key question of fundamental metaphilosophy is done, can refer to the name Lichtenberg, almost an, as an abbreviated response to them. This is a very interesting text because he uh, here makes very important questions regarding the possibility of transcendental philosophy, and the answer is Lichtenberg. Um, aus welchen Bestimmungen des Vorstellungsvermögens entspringt das System und kann die Vollständigkeit der Elemente desselben gebildet werden, indem man jenes in uns a priori befindliche Ganze analysiert und das Formal desselben aus, eigene, aus seiner eigenen Vernunft entwickelt? Das ist die uh, the, that's the question uh, uh, concerning the, 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 the uh, uh, common element. Uh, from them uh, all the uh, 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 capacities to represent good, uh, 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 or, or where the uh, most uh, capacities of uh, knowledge could find uh, its origins. And the answer to this question is just the name of Lichtenberg. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that this text seems to show us that the waste is Kant's work, this waste is, I suppose, uh, is the name I give uh, the Opus Postulum, the waste is of Kant's work can only be interpreted, interpreted from the waste is of Lichtenberg, yeah, the, uh, the Süderbücher. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
One could say that there is a sort of misunderstanding there. That is, it is actually what the, uh, most of interpreters uh, comment mm -hmm. uh, about this this passage. Uh, I think, for example, of uh, uh, of uh, Ludwig Sieb, for example, and uh, he even says something like, uh, "Well, as." An interpretation of Kant's philosophy, this is so mistaken that it cannot, uh, the text cannot, cannot address actually Kant. It, 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 it is uh, the, the target of the critique to be actually an argument, a law or someone else. But I think, I think uh, the, this, this way to, to, to evaluate the relevance of the passage is to a certain point uh, um, uh, misunderstands Hegel, uh, I, I would say to a certain point, but I because I think Hegel's point in, in the passage is actually uh, to, to uh, make the question, and a very important question, how can transcendental philosophy explain its own possibility? And this is a very difficult question for Kant. I mean, he, he actually did not address this question as such. And what I was trying to do was um, finding or figuring uh, out uh, a way to answer uh, this question from the text uh, uh, by Kant himself. And, and mainly a way, uh, a way that discusses the, the very typical idea between uh, the interpreters uh, who has been interested in such problems that Kant is a sort of phenomenologist. Uh, of, uh, of uh, I mean, the main part of uh, philosophers who has asked, uh, who have uh, uh, made the, questions, uh, the question about the possibility of uh, transcendental philosophy itself, um, have made uh, this question in the in the uh, in the mark of uh, the, the, in, in, in the framework of the discussion uh, in terminology. And I think uh, the the very idea uh, or, or, or the uh, discussion that Kant makes uh, of the uh, topic of the impossibility of uh, total error and uh, his uh, very uh, to my view, nice uh, 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 obsession with uh, completeness and uh, also other uh, methodical indications, uh, for example, concerning the uh, the uh, hypothetical method uh, or the, uh, in the in the critique of pure reason, are actually the way in which he tried to answer this this question. This question namely the question uh, concerning the possibility of uh, transcendental philosophy. Um, so, um, can, I, can I ask a, a follow-up? Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess that, that, that sort of idea is this right that Hegel said, well, kind of you, you, you need to, to explain how transcendental philosophy is, is possible. And then, and then the, the strategy that you're taking is, is that but what Kant does is shows that transcendental, uh, the transcendental philosophy can't be completely wrong. It can't be subject to a total error. Is that? It's actually good? that transcendental philosophy identifies. Uh, I mean, that the problem that transcendental philosophy identifies uh, could only be be identified if you suppose some correction criteria. Mm -hmm. And those criteria are uh, the criteria that uh, the transcendental philosophy must itself fulfill. For example, the solution of the contradiction of reason with itself. And in, in that pursuit, it couldn't be... Uh, and in, or, in order to do that, it must be... Uh, it must... It, it, it must be to uh, it must be made clear that uh, total error is impossible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's okay. But I wonder. I mean, 
There's, so once, okay, so the, that's shown, but um, it seems like um, Kant's transcendental philosophy could be mistaken in, in ways that are not, that don't have to do with total error, right? And Hegel could say, well, I mean, you just, this, this idea of the antinomies, for example, was ill formulated or, or something like that. Um, it's it's not just total, total error. It's actually the, the, the main, the main uh, correction criteria, I think, is, is the, this uh, hypothetic, hypothetical thought that Kant introduces in the, in the first, uh, uh, in the, in the, in, in the uh, um, uh, at the very beginning of the, of the critique of pure reason, namely the idea that uh, the, the, the formula is the following: you have you have a contradiction, but you have criteria under which you detect this, the, the, such a contradiction is a problem. So, uh, under the guidance of uh, those criteria, you uh, formulate uh, an hypothesis, and the consequence of this hypothesis could be that uh, this contradiction is solved. Yeah. And um, that, that is, to, uh, to my view, the, the most important criteriological or methodological criteria that can be introduced in the critique of purism. But in order to do that, uh, in order to do that, uh, it is important to make clear that the error at the beginning of the critique of purism cannot be a total error. That's, that's, that's why the, the, the doctrine of the impossibility of total error is so important to my view, even in the critique of pure reason. It's not that total error is, is the only uh, 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 methodological criteria to which Kant appeals in order to, uh, to make clear that transcendental philosophy is possible. I mean, you know, uh, you know that there is this uh, different, uh, this uh, difficult topic concerning the differences between, for example, the, uh, the uh, different um, uh, fallacies mm -hmm. uh, which uh, are treated in the dialectic, namely uh, paradoxism and antinomies and and, uh, and so on. Um, and the, the so-called transcendental illusion. I do not have um, an interpretation concerning this difference. I, I, I know that there is this difference, mm -hmm. but um, I don't know if, if I have something better to say about it uh, than uh, Michelle Weir uh, has said in, in her, to my view, uh, excellent uh, book 
uh, about the, the Kant's doctrine of transcendental illusion. And I think what he, what is right is that what he says at the very beginning of the uh, uh, of the first preface uh, is. Um, is a sort of uh, general account of, of the problem which motivated the critique of pure reason. And uh, it is right that uh, the treatment that he make in the, in the beginning of the dialectic suppose, uh, suppose many of the, uh, of the uh, conceptual framework uh, that he introduced in the critique itself, and that's not the case at the very at the beginning of the first preface. At the beginning of the first preface, he just wanted to make clear that there is a problem if you have uh, in the develop in the, in the very in, in the developing of uh, uh, of a cognitive faculty like reason, if you have always at the end just contradictions. <laughs> It, it is just uh, this the idea at the, at the beginning, I would say. So um, I think, indeed, that at the beginning there is any, there, there is there is not any account of error that I I, I, I would uh, discuss this this idea. I, I think you 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 suppose it in in, uh, in in your question or mm -hmm. not? Did you imply that there there was a sort of idea of error? Uh, I have. Mm, here in the, the second text, uh, in the, like, in the second, says, uh, the, what's written, we are many kind, but here in both, the world, 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 the the world, the world, the world, it doesn't mean that uh, he uh, presents there uh, a conception or a philosophical view about her. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's at this point just uh, uh, appealing uh, to our uh, common idea that <coughs> you contradict yourself, you are. And uh, this is, uh, and if you are, and, and if you are consistently as a sort of uh, consequence of the use of reason, then you have a philosophical problem. Right? <laughs> I mean, uh, that's the idea. But it doesn't imply this. This idea doesn't imply a sort of account of her. And and you're right. At the beginning of the of, of the dialectic, and in all texts. Uh, you can find such an account, and you can find su uh, in such account uh, very, very interesting uh, different differences that he makes between uh, forms of error, transcendental illusion, uh, fallacies in the philosophy, in, in, in metaphysics, uh, etc. But uh, this, uh, so to speak, uh, theory of error. Is not presented in the in the first preface, and is not treated, and I would say it's not even uh, presupposed. I don't know if this is going to make any sense, but uh, leaving aside a little bit the textual evidence that you were discussing now, uh, and moving to the relation of. Kant and Lichtenberg in terms of papers. Uh, paying attention to the papers, one could think that there's a very subversive economy in Lichtenberg, uh, a heuristic skepticism uh, towards Kant, Copernic, and systematic revolution. Um, if I understood well your, the answer to the first question, you have put the possibility of transcendental philosophy in the fact that we can trust and access to the effect of the formal conditions of possibility of representation. Uh, it's a way of putting it. Uh, so, I mean, if we can trust that we can access, and we can trust what we access, the, the effects of the formal conditions of formal conditions of possibility of representation, when then there's something like transcendental philosophy should be able to sustain itself as knowledge. Uh, so, 
not thinking now in error, in the possibility of total error, but something that might work or not with that, which is the parodic status of Lichtenberg's discourse. Uh, this kind of more than unstable irony that we have seen gives the status to the discussion, which you cannot really know what he's saying. Uh, if one looks at that realistically, it's like pre-Kantian, pre-Kantian revolution, well, obviously, in terms of if, uh, realistic, if you look realistically at that, you find that the object is deceptive. It, it, it's deceptive, it doesn't tell you the truth, so it doesn't work. But if you look in transcendental terms, if you ask for the formal conditions of positive representation, still, you find forms that behave in ways in which representation is unstable. And it, it gets, so, in a way, what we would have here is kind of a crazy schematism of the imagination that has completely interrupted uh, the, the transition between sensibility and, and, and intellect, or to put it in a different way, the sort of crazy schematism that has completely um, liberated uh, the, scheme, the, the schemes of the, of the imagination from the tutelage of the categories and the non-contradiction of the intellect. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would try, I try to say from very, very long distance, not in a textual based mm -hmm. uh, analysis. It's how this papers, in a way, is a paper that, that makes you doubt that you can uh, uh, that you can be certain of all the conditions of positive representation because you have a form, you can, in, in, in parody, you see form. Form is very visible, mm -hmm. but the effect is completely uh, unreachable. I mean, it's unstable, which is exactly what you need for transcendental philosophy, is that you can access form in the beginning with, but also the effects of this formal conditions for the representation remain not, I mean, you, you can define the effect. Yeah, right. I mean, do you mean uh, this last uh, description was the description of uh, Lichtenberg's papers? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, this kind of, unstable. I mean, we have seen that it's like you never know what Lichtenberg is yeah, right. saying because he has some, this apparistic way of writing. I have, I have this. So I'm not self-contradictory. I'm kind of unstable in, in an ironic way, in more than ironic way. I have some problems as, as I uh, as I wanted to write something about Lichtenberg. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I know soon yeah, that it, it was very difficult to, to fix the uh, position. Uh, uh, and I think you're right, you're right. I, I think but what, 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 that you, 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 you did read Lichtenberg, as you were saying, and you accessed his form. And you, you were enjoying his literature, but you were unable like, to extract the representation and fix it. And that right. is, is very uh, subversive of the premises of transcendental philosophy. To so a certain can, point. Can, yes. Yeah. And, uh, this is very interesting because if, if this is so, and I, I agree with you, it is quite surprising that Kant uh, yeah. says yeah. explicitly yeah. that yeah. Lichtenberg is a transcendental philosopher. Yeah. And it is very interesting because in, uh, most of, of uh, references uh, in Kant's uh, texts on Lichtenberg uh, are founded in Opus Postum. Yeah. And in, in the in the texts in which he discusses the notion of transcendental philosophy, mm -hmm. uh, and it is it is uh, I think it is a complete misinterpretation to my point of view, uh, just because of what you are saying now. I mean, in Kant's philosophy, the, the point is to to a certain point uh, completely different. I mean, the point is this is that. You, just, you, you cannot just understand the problem of transcendental philosophy if you, don't, if you do not assume the, uh, uh, the conditions under which those problems could be solved. I mean, it is, it is uh, like this uh, very, uh, very uh, to, to, to my view at least, uh, 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 Wonderful dictum of uh, Christine Korsberg in the Sources of, of Normativity: uh, The conditions of solution of, of a problem are the condition uh, under which the problem is uh, uh, rightly formulated. Uh, and I mean, that is exactly the point in Kant. And um, I would I, I I would agree with you that uh, in the the. The, the pathos in Lichtenberg's philosophy is, is quite hard. Uh, uh, 
it's not about uh, getting a contradiction and then try to solve it, uh, but actually to to express uh, what to a certain point cannot be uh, completely at least understood or fixed in language. Uh, I, I think, for example, on those uh, very beautiful texts in which he speaks about uh, declinations or uh, variables in, in mathematics and in language, like for example, we or, or uh, uh, which are actually the way in which we uh, should interpret or understand uh, words like uh, soul or uh, uh, words like that. I mean. Uh, you're right. This is, this is quite another part. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>
and the historicity of language itself, along with the refusal of the presupposition of an individual creator and of an, any idea of a universal language. In the 1771 contest, a young laureate, laureate uh, Johann Gottfried Herder, posed the hypothesis of language as an instinct and at the same time as a mode of orientation, granting it cognitive scope in its own right and making of the relation <coughs> between human reason and language something definitively indiscernible. Let us add the attribution of a priori a priorism to the verbal elements by Hamann's metacritique of Kant. And the outcome of this process vision for Humboldt, linking the question of the origin of language to the reciprocal determination of language of thinking, as Herder already had done, will state that language is the formative organ of thinking. Georg Christoph Lichtenberg is one of the many authors who over those two centuries dealt with matters of language. But this case, but his case is eminent. It seems plausible to say that it is with Lichtenberg more than with any other modern thinker that the linguistic dimension comes to the forefront. In any case, it is glaringly evident that he can neither be aligned with the 17th century reformers nor with the theoreticians of the origin of language. None of both interests is present in Lichtenberg's work. As concerns the former, in his early notes there are references to Leibniz's characteristic universalis, always with signs of reluctance. Regarding the latter, he speaks only once, not of the origin but of the invention of language, <clears throat> just to indicate that it precedes the invention of philosophy, with a precise intention to which I will come back. Thus, if Lichtenberg could pay attention to the idea of a universal language, there was no other way than considering it utterly odd due to its inanity, for on the one hand the whole man, an expression he borrows from Addison and Steele in The Spectator, exceeds far beyond any possibility of expression through such a means, and on the other hand the inevitable abstraction of this means would aggravate the generality of natural language. In fact, the axiomatic or apodictic force <clears throat> of the mathematical laws that could serve as a model for a universal language are restricted to a certain frame. They are auxiliary resources, Hulfsmittel, whose seeming unconditional force has to be inscribed under the heading of our inevitable anthropomorphism. This anthropomorphism, which is essentially instinctive, determines the human modes of access to the external world. If language is a structural condition of the human being, the generality of words reflects, in its turn, the generality of our concepts and representations. Lichtenberg says, since some sciences endeavor to discover universal principle may often be just as fruitless as endeavor of a mineralogist to discover some primary universal element through the compounding of which all minerals arose. Nature creates neither genera nor species, but individual. And our short-sightedness, we must seek in our short-sightedness, we must seek our similarities to be able to retain many things simultaneously. These concepts become more and more inaccurate the broader the categories uh, which we create. End of quote. Furthermore, Lichtenberg doesn't run the typical strategy of enlightened reflections on language, which trust in an abbreviated structural and functional traits posing a question about its origin, and to draw from them epistemic, moral, political, and classic anthropological conclusions, since in language resides a specific determination of the human being. Of course, such issues are not alien to Lichtenberg, but for him there is no way to skip ordinary language, because one always inhabits it. This is, in the end, the anthropological truth of language and of its punitive origin. Irrespective of all speculations about the emergence of language and of the multiplicity of tongues, Lichtenberg's interest is directed to its functioning and its operations. The language, when inhabits, <coughs> constituted before any linguistic performance of the subject, is our ordinary language of everyday life, on which any cognitive and communicative purpose has forced it to count, and this applies especially to philosophy. Language, says this note, originated prior to philosophy, and that is what makes philosophy difficult, especially when it is a matter of making it clear to those who do not themselves reflect very much. When philosophy speaks, it is always compelled to express itself in the language of non-philosophy. End of quote. <coughs> Lichtenberg speaks of an invention, a findung of language, which can also be a finding, a discovery. Uh, <coughs> um, yeah. In any case, the fact that we inhabit already a linguistic milieu, that language in this sense precedes us, determines at the same time its force and its misery. 
This force and this misery combine what we could call the language's automatism, by virtue of which we trust that the meanings we convey by means of it, notwithstanding that we may be aware of possible misunderstandings and deceptions, reflect our thoughts and representations, and in some say something about reality, as if words and expressions that belong to the realm of the general could effectively refer to the particularity of things. It is an entirely unavoidable effect of all languages, says Lichtenberg, that they express only the general concepts and seldom can say adequately what they wish to say. For if we compare our words with things, we discover that the latter consists in a wholly different order from the former. The properties we have set in our souls are connected in such a way that it is not easy to delineate a boundary between them, but the words with which we express them are not constituted in this way. Two successive and related properties are expressed with signs that seem to indicate no relationship with one another. <clears throat> we should be able to define words philosophically and to indicate their relationship through modifications. In the geometrical analysis of line A, one indefinite section of it is called X. The other section is not called Y, as in ordinary life, but A minus X. That this is <coughs> mathematical. This is why mathematical language has such great advantages over ordinary language. End of quote. This note accuses two insufficiencies of language, which are mentioned with relative reiteration in the Zulubricher. One of them concerns what could be brief, briefly called the kinship of things and of the properties and characteristics. The other concerns singularities. Nature creates, says Lichtenberg, neither genera nor species. Its fabric produces only individua. The core of Lichtenberg's linguistic skepticism lies precisely here, in the singularity of everything. I will address this one in the next section. I will skip a <coughs> section on, on, on Montaigne and Bacon. The inseparability of thinking and language that Lichtenberg assumes more radically than his predecessors and that tends to confine the subject in an anthropomorphic closure poses a dilemma whose treatment defines the originality of the Second, the insignificant, that what is deemed insubstantial and futile, has a peculiar situation in the discourse of philosophy. It does not deserve a proper attention. Theorizing about it would be useless. Yet it can be subsumed <clears throat> and served as an example. This is the great lesson that young Socrates learns not without embarrassment from the Iliadic master and Plato's Parmenides, a lesson that is bequeathed by him <clears throat> as a methodic, methodical rule to all philosophical posterity. This posterity would merit an inquiry with a view to a philosophical history of the insignificant. It would be said that the little and the unimportant, as such, with no further determination, own philosophy and its discourse. And so far, they are symptoms of the unconceptualizable, which is not to be equated to the rational. In Lichtenberg's case, they are essentially what provoke, what elicits thinking. In fact, the attention to the insignificant and the critique of general schools is for him the hallmark of genius and of philosophy. I skip a long quote about this, precisely about this issue. Uh, he speaks here of the uh, conduct of the the conduct of the great genius when he's uh, judging about things. This is the appropriate response to nature's interpolation. On the, other, on the one hand, sorry, this attention to everyday relevances corresponds to Lichtenberg's epistemological belief, which is in line with his scientific activity about the priority of concrete observation of an abstract speculation. On the other hand, it surpasses by far the limits of scientific research, or stated otherwise, it expands the field of science itself. But what are the individua? <clears throat> the notes in the Zudelbücher that contain the term are rather few, but by no means negligible. At face value, individual would be individual things, subtantia prima, for instance, uh, <clears throat> given they are confronted with genome and species. Determined in the existence in time and space, or else only in time, if there are characteristics, properties, or modifications of the subject. However, the sense in which Wittenberg applies the term seems to point in a different direction. Not things in the stable consistency, but in the changes, or I would say, things in variation. The individual are not just objects and facts, but so to say, the swarm of variations that constitutes them, and at the same time, destabilizes them. To see all events, this is a quote, to see all events all be given like, as individual is particularly eloquent in this context. Yet this is what it seems to say. 
in order to ensure a certain consistency and continuity, to translate facts into representations. And this is a primary moment in which facts start to be representations. And representations are linguistically registered, first and foremost, in the common language of common life, which is also a primary moment, starting from which representations are science and works. So that in the end, the world of representations in which a subject inhabits is the world of words, the word of it. Thus, in a certain way, it could be said that this world, which for the subject is the world, results from disregarding individual. Insignificant as they are, individuals have an essential proclivity to escape observation, but at the same time they are the sub of experience. The requirement that needs to be fulfilled in order to pay attention to them is precisely minute observation, but at the same time they, that's sorry, that is minute observation, an acute perception, but not necessarily of the focal kind, a focal or center of attention, which we use to equate with observation, as if there were only one mode of paying attention, tends to lose sight of what makes the singularity of the singular, and so as it, as it relies upon the guidance of representation and puts the name before the thing. The other kind of perception is rather a sort of twilight. This other kind of perception is rather a sort of twilight or threshold perception, to see with eyes that close, to cast a sight on glance, to hear in passing, to let oneself to be touched in diverse ways by what we observe. This is probably the privilege that Lichtenberg grants to dreams and the epistemic as well as moral importance that he attributes to them. In dreams, singularities alter the order, order of representations and present themselves before we put on them the stamp of the name, as given another quote. The attention to which singularities reveal themselves is strictly related to the experimentalism that is at the center of Lichtenberg's scientific activity. Of course, experimentalism presupposes a fundamental change with respect to the 17th century of belief in Baconian simple natures, which as basic and essential elements are permanent and invariable. The experiment, and not just the one that is performed at the laboratory or in the classroom, but also the one that is carried out in subjective, subjunctive tense by mere thinking, which is a mere experiment, the mental experiment, the Duncan experiment, Thus, in Lichtenberg, the experiment has in Lichtenberg the signification of a change of epistemological pattern. Nature itself is instable and variable, and only concrete experience, combined with the observation that cares for details and for variation, may reach an adequate knowledge. Certainly not a definitive one, but a knowledge by approximation, which is susceptible to be constantly contrasted, and so far as we can always invent new errors, as Lichtenberg says. This, in its turn, makes it possible to catch new glimpses through old holes. It follows from this epistemic disposition a different status of truth. Stop your chattering. What do you want? If the stars are no longer fixed in their places, how can you continue to say that truth is still truth? That alles, das alles wahre wahr ist. Of course, this does not mean to deny truth itself. It is a rebuttal of the belief in the stability of truth. The point is that this belief declares itself to be truth, an imminent one that boldly offers itself as the truth of truth. The rebuttal of this belief is a central feature of what I could call could I would call Lichtenberg's performative epistemological skepticism. I said performative with the intention to suggest that it is not a stubborn skepticism, reluctant to grant the epistemic validity of any statement. It is rather skepticism and constant exercise in pursuit of truths, of a plurality of truths, equivalent to what Lichtenberg himself calls the invention of truth, in the original sense of invention. This skepticism defines its method of philosophizing, as Lichtenberg calls it, uh, defines its method uh, of philosophizing as the immediate distrust in any opinion as soon as it is formulated. Quote, one of the most fruitful means, fruitful means of discovery, while not, on, not even by the questions quiz, quiz, sorry, quid, quiz, ubi, is when upon hearing something, when, as upon hearing something, one asks, is this true, and searches for reasons for one's answer. This sort of programmed reaction is at the core of Lichtenberg's performative skepticism, and it immunizes the subject against the stagnation of truth, provided that the method methodical principle of this reaction can be maintained throughout the course of a constant investigative exercise. That is not true in Cartwright's error as the dynamics of this exercise, to err is to search, 
and combines them separately, tooth and non-tooth, in the rhythm of this dynamics, where non-tooth is not mere falsity, but the driver of the search. As truth is unstable, it cannot be confined in a systematic exposition of knowledge. Its instability rejects the doctrinal structure of the three levels. However, this doesn't result in sheer dissemination. Against doctrine and rhapsody, Lichtenberg opposes the idea of a system of thinking, a Gedankensystem. Of course, whoever peeps into the Zubelbücher has a right to ask what kind of a system may be this combination of notes. The impression of randomness seems unavoidable. Nevertheless, I think that beneath this appearance, there is in fact an order, the order of a thinking that is in continual process. I'll try to suggest which order would it be in my third and last section. Meanwhile, I shall limit myself to say something about what could be considered as the rule of this process. The rule is a form of thinking, and this form is the idea, Einfall, which in German does as fallen to fall, that's the meaning of the unannounced, the sudden, what occurs to me. Contingency is its condition and urgency its temporal rhythm. Urgent is here the rescue of events and a singular emergence. This rescue has the character of truth, but always in plural. It is what Lichtenberg calls the penning truths, pennies Wahrheiten. Each of them is an event, nothing fixed and nothing solid. The virtual consolation of all of them is a whole Milky Way of ideas, and it can submit for us upon Einfeld. But at the same time that Einfälle open themselves to what happens, they are instances of singularization of the thinking subject. Ideas bear testimony to a disposition by virtue of which thinking coincides with a swarm of the real. Quote, there is something in us that is so difficult to discard as old Adam, and that drives us always to the artificial and the bad. <coughs> and what is that? The story. <coughs> Drives us as always to the artificial and the bad, the latter being so closely related to the artificial. And what is that? Answer that we are not encouraged to be individual in thinking. In absolute terms, human being writes always well when he writes himself, when a sich schreibt. In the spirit of this note, I, it likewise may, may be said that a human being thinks well when he thinks by, in heaven, by himself. On the one hand, it marks a strict individuation of the individual. The peculiar use of the reflexive pronoun, reflexive pronoun which alters the normal functioning of the transitive verb to write, sign us as a condition of good writing, writing oneself, writing from the own experience, the own feeling and thinking. But on the other hand, it states the essential difference that lies in self-reference. The impersonal self is an irreducible hiatus, an original passivity, in the spontaneity of the thinking of the I think. I and myself, says Lichtenberg. I feel myself. These are two things, says Lichtenberg, and scoring the grammatical conditioning of philosophy. This point of view calls into question the consistency of the subject and its ontological rooting. Certainly, this doesn't mean that it, the I would the soul. It means that it cannot claim a right to substantive and simple identity. Its consistency is functional. This is what leads Lichtenberg to criticize the Cartesian cogito and to sympathize with the Kantian I think, understood as a transcendental function, although in a radicalization of the Kantian concept. This prefers also the way toward the Nietzschean critique, one could say. Quote, we become conscious of certain representations that are not dependent upon us. Others, at least we believe, are dependent upon us. Where is the boundary? We know only the existence of our sensations, representations, and thoughts. It thinks, we should say, just as one says, it likes. To say cogito is already too much if we translate it, translate it as I think. To assume the I, to postulate it, is a practical necessity. To think goes always a step beyond I and myself. To think by oneself is not certainly to perfectly coincide with oneself. Who is there? asks Lichtenberg. Just I. Oh, that is quite superfluous. What actually counts here is the personality of it thinks as the core of the activity of the mind. Lichtenberg's problematization of the corridor, the recognition of a constitutive difference determining the subject, the relativization of personal identity, all of this is marked by an essential index of emancipation, which characterizes Lichtenberg's subscription of the enlightenment problem. 
This index is centered in an unrestricted autonomy and freedom of thinking, which is the release of Kogitari from any ontological rooting and from all dogmatic stagnation. To avoid, quote, to avoid every autos effa, magister this, and to promote ever more the Kogitari out there to think, I just leave them back, anticipating the Kantian model Sabere Aude, which can't borrow us from ours. Third and last section. Given, on the one hand, the generality and abstraction of language, and on the other, the calling of a thinking that is attentive to the singularity of things and events, the consequence of a radical linguistic skepticism seems inevitable, with catastrophic epistemological implications, because uh, if something singular could be known as such, it would be absolutely incommunicable. The, as Lichtenberg says, the correction of linguistic use, the Berichtigung der Sprache, for which Lichtenberg advocates, would be an infinite task, probably desperate. The manuscript of one of Lichtenberg's lectures reflects, perhaps, something of this unease. Quote, I have already frequently desired that a language should exist in which every falsity were utterly impossible to be said, or at least that any error, contrary to truth, were a grammatical one. End of quote. Nevertheless, the neutrality of it thinks opens to a different relation to language. Quote, those who think a great deal for themselves, when one feels abstinct, will find much wisdom recorded in language. We probably do not have it for ourselves, but much wisdom does reside there, just as in Proverbs. And this is precisely the Gogitaria Aude playing its destiny in and with language. It may seem odd that self-thinking to think by oneself in a certain way is invited to rely on language whose condition and structure essentially non-individual but public and intersubjective is irretrievable. Just as what is said belongs to the order of general generalities, so who speaks is forced to abandon the thought of itself if he wants to communicate and share his thoughts in order to understand them to be understood. However, for Lichtenberg, there are tracks disseminated across common language, frequently equivocal, which provide an access always transitory to the details of the real. This access has nothing to do with the functioning of, functioning of language when it fills its communicative task, which can only confirm what we already know about the world and about ourselves, and what we deem to know about, about language itself. With respect to this functioning and its most accomplished achievement, it could be said that what Lichtenberg comments in a letter concerning Newton's theory of light, quote, our best and purest crystal continues to be a mirror as a sign that not everything passes through. And of course, there will, one must pay attention to impurities. Pure philosophy, says Lichtenberg, pure philosophy unwittingly still continues and cannot help continuing this love affair with impure philosophy. And so it will continue until the end of time. End of course. To notice this is a trait of the cogitare aude, which discovers in the insufficiencies of language the loopholes through which to catch a glimpse of singularities or to let singularities to peep out. Nothing is more illustrative, more fruitful for thinking by oneself than paying attention to the automatisms of language, as for instance the following. When our deceased cow still lived, said once a woman in Göttingen. Yet it is not only about inconsistency, which at times reveal much more than what it, an island discipline has forced into consistency and congruity. Dead ends of language, no matter how illogical they may be, can provide to the one who pays attention and thinks all of the lucidity that we can get amidst the twilight of things and events. In addition to these malfunctions, there are also the rhetorical devices by which language compensates its deficits. Metaphor occupies an eminent place, provided we understand it as characteristics. Quote, characteristics, vir gregis ipse capo, abuse for lack of a better word, so our words are mainly characteristics. End of quote. Indeed, it would not be permissible to extrapolate this assertion, suggesting that Lichtenberg assigns to the whole of language a characteristic condition due to its generality. There is no immediate way for the appearance of individual on the linguistic screen, and all mediation cannot but substitute words for words. You cannot save the individual, but maybe it is possible to elicit its fugitive presence in the loopholes of language. Considering that ordinary language is irreducible and that thinking cannot be dissociated from it, the solution so to say, consists in a linguistic practice that is oriented and exercised by the Kogitare Aude and that is attentive to the body of language. 
to its rhetorical devices and its flaws, a practice that extracts from language itself the potentiality to bring to the light, incidentally and in each case, the singularity that is at stake. It could be said that this is a problem of the pseudo -Bücher. For, for in the case of Lichtenberg's occupation with language, the issue does not concern solely what it says about language, nor the modes of its things, but also the materiality of language itself, which ultimately refers to the relation between the body of language and the embodied thinking of the subject. The intervention of thinking in the body of language not only produces the interruption of the automatisms of language, which are the philosophy proper to everyday utterances, but it produces at the same time, through this interruption, the suspension of the inveterate automatisms of thinking grounded on its unstoppable propensity to universalize. So the example of the Göttingen woman's deceased cow that illustrates the linguistic inertia is confronted with entries that bring along with them something that may be called an effect of paralysis or suspension that interrupts the inertia of thinking. Quote, there are many quotes here. A tomb, is always, a tomb is always, in the end, the best fortress against the storms of destiny. Just as they paint a zebra over the heads of saints, undoubtedly the strangest thing about this thought is that if he had it a half minute later, he would have it after his death. There lie the potatoes, and they sleep against the resurrection. If you can strike a blow to a reasonable man and make him stupid, I don't see why you couldn't hit a fool and make him intelligent. The one who is in love with himself has at least in his love the advantage that he won't have many rivals. An autopsy cannot uncover those faults that end with death. To smell what time is, what time it is, a peculiar clock indeed. A fish that dawned in the air. Cupolas of churches invaded funnels to conduct prayer to heaven. And of course, a famous knife without grave that is lacking of its angle, included in that fake option catalog. It may be thought that these are mere developmentals, though some of which you may find funny, others insipid. But it would uh, convenient to put them in connection with Lichtenberg's experimental focus and with the exemplary character that experimental practices have for the science of the epoch, whose interest is directed to the discontinuous and irregular, insofar as it forces to rethink the legal system that had to codify and govern the knowledge of phenomena. Two are the poles that come into relation in this process, in this process. One is the formulation of new legalities that are able to integrate the phenomena that the old system cannot explain, or thus explains only insufficiently. The other pole is the singularity of those phenomena. Lichtenberg is primarily interested in this singularity, and consequently in reinforcing the tension between those poles. The instances I have cited foster precisely this interest in what concerns the relations of thinking and language. They belong to the large inventory of mental experiments of diverse kind and construction, although its principles may be concisely formulated. Quote, which variations, Abbachungen, would it suffer if certain circumstances are modified? I mean, I spoke of effects of paralysis and of suspension. I'm not sure that these are the most propitious terms. It could be so provided that we understand that they are minimal effects. Each, of the, no, each one of the sentences I cited is a production of meaning. What happens in them is a slip, a little stumbling that changes all the process in the guise of a shifter that leads it from one series of meaning to another. It is precisely an Abweichung, a deviation, or as I said before, a variation. I will skip here a long uh, passage on uh, electricity and factors. Uh, so, <clears throat> let's go to it. Recapitulating, it may be said that the peculiarity of Lichtenberg's approach consists in maintaining a skeptical attitude toward language, but at the same time acknowledging the irre irreducibility and anteriority of ordinary language, without attempting any reform of it. Instead, he accomplishes a written performance that exploits the very ductility and inaccuracy that constitutes the deficit of natural language in order to obtain, by means of a tactic, tactics of short secret, what Lichtenberg himself calls new glimpses through old holes. That is to say, ad hoc truths about individual facts, about events in the singularity, as if they were so many sparks of evidence. So, that's it. about eight minutes, seven minutes or something like that.
So thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs>